everyone, and welcome to Picture This 1999, uh, day two of our big hollow weekend uh, where I'm dropping a different video every day because everything piles up toward the end of the month. And I'm like, wait, we have to record like 30 different things. Uh, but I'm very excited to uh, do our monthly show here where we go through every Best Picture nominee in the history of Best Picture nominees. Chad, sir, how are you doing? Doing great. Um, yeah, it, it was a little challenging to try to squeeze in some of these into the horror month. But we did our best to make this year sort of match a little bit of a horror yeah. vibe. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the Best Picture winner of the year has some spooky overtones. There is a quite literal horror movie from Midnight Shyamalan and the Bunch. Uh, there's a movie uh, by Stephen King uh, adaptation. Uh, you know, you have Michael Caine's accent, Cider House Rules. Like, a lot of scary things for, for this uh, for this month. Uh, but we can't do it alone, Chad. It, it's Halloween. We got to have some fun. We got to have some tricks or treats. And I see web people. Um, so I'm going to bring on Carrie Webb. Carrie, welcome to the show. I'll put you up there with your husband so people can see your name because uh, no one cares about mine. Uh, how's it going, Carrie? Going good, thanks. How are you? Doing great. Uh, we're very excited. I mean, I can't believe this is the first time you've been on the show, but I know you watch a lot of these movies with us, so it's going to be fun to kind of like hear your thoughts and perspective, because uh, I know sometimes you and Chad have very similar tastes, sometimes you don't, so um, I'm, I'm really excited. Uh, Chad, any any words for our guests, even though you live in the same house? <laughs> um, love you. Uh, <laughs> you. If your ranking is different, it's okay. <laughs> We rank stuff all the time over on my channel, so you know, <laughs> yep, sometimes it is very different. <laughs> there you go. Um, the five movies we will be talking about for 1999, however, are American Beauty, The Cider House Rules, The Green Mile, The Insider, and The Sixth Sense. Uh, as we said, for our Halloween month, we wanted to pick something with a horror representation in the lineup. Uh, let's just jump right in. Why, why don't we? Because we have a lot of f to films to talk about and a lot of uh, notable films to bring up because this is probably the year with probably the most honorable mentions, at least for me. Um, but Chad, uh, take us into the history of 1999. What do you uh, set the scene? Because we're we were all alive at this point. It's rare we hit a year where yeah. we, are, we all are. <laughs> uh, I was a, a year, so I have very in the nineties re recollection. But uh, my first movie I ever saw in theaters was in nineteen ninety nine, the Tigger movie. Um, so shout out, mom, to take me to that. Uh, I hope they bring back another Winnie the Pooh something so you can bring Elliot to one of those. But yeah. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so Chad, tell us about nineteen ninety nine. Mine was in ninety five, Casper, and I think Carrie's was ninety four, The Lion King. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. That that's a yeah. fun uh, film festival right there. We yeah. should do that one day. Yeah. We should like do a uh, like a marathon where we watch like all our first movies and then podcast about them. I don't know. Love that idea. idea to put on the back burner. I don't know. Yeah. So I don't have a lot of history here. Um, I just kind of skimmed and I found some like a few interesting things. Um, I was nine. Carrie was, I don't know, probably eight or something like that. Um, and you were one. In 1999 is also designated the year of older persons, which kind of plays into the, the themes of some of these movies. Okay. Um, the Euro currency is established. Uh, the Mars Polar Lander is launched. Bill Clinton is acquitted in impeachment proceedings. Uh, the Melissa Worm attacks the Internet. It's a virus. Um, oh. And then uh, Napster is created, which went on to inspire a lot of other download sites for music of that time. Those crazy kids downloading nice. everything. Nice. The Melissa Worm, I didn't know what if it was a disease or a dance move. <laughs> so thank you for clarifying. <laughs> um, I didn't know. Uh, Carrie, do you have any personal experiences from 99 that you can recall or, or not? Oh, not really. my gosh. Wow. I mean, um, you probably both remember. Uh, do you remember the turn of the century? Was that like a big deal? Yeah. Because uh, I, I obviously yeah. don't. Yeah. What was that like? Yeah. Um, you know, people like the I don't know if you've heard of Y2K. Y2K. You know, mm -hmm. Everyone thought all the stuff, computers yeah. might just like crap out. Um, although I remember it being like, you know, like a thing people talked about, but you know, it wasn't taken too too seriously. We were right. kind of too young to really like war have that be something we were worried about. Right. Like we didn't have like all of our financial records on <laughs> right. computers yeah. that we were like, oh, what do we do? Right, if the bank right. says you have now zero money, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> but that was just so cool to experience a century change. Like I couldn't imagine. It was really cool to see the, the ball drop and then just go, wow. All right. This is a, a new thing now. So, yeah. Yeah. I remember it was like pretty amped up that year, New Year's. And then, um, that was the first year I went to Disney, Disney World. Oh, nice. So, and I nice. remember we have all the like, actually, my, they're probably in my sister's basement, like 
Disney 2000s like ornaments and stuff like that. Nice. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, I, I think there's also an idea of like, it, I know the world wasn't going to end, but some people are conspiracy theorists and, and mm-hmm. too, but even just the idea of like, this is the last year of this century. Like, I feel like that's why we get so many good films this year too. Cause it's like the studios wanted to go out this year with a bang and then kick off their next year with like kind of this new kind of fresh lens. So that's why you get a lot of like some of the most iconic films of all time in multiple genres, I'd say uh, not mm-hmm. even in the slate. And I, I kind of talked to Chad beforehand about like, before I watched these movies, like I, I felt like I could replace all five of these with five other movies not because these five aren't good. Um, some of them I like better than others, but because there are just so many other great films in 99 too. Like you could just make a five out of yeah. 20 different films. You could put any combination together. So that's what I, I think is so interesting about this slate in particular and, and this year in film. Um, but do we want to go around and, and talk about some honorable mentions of like movies that you want to bring up for 1999 that you think are notable? Uh, Chad, I know you kind of give us the, the first rundown of lists and then we'll, we'll go around. Do we want to um, go straight into the movies? or? Oh, that's right. We have births, deaths, and albums. I, I always <laughs> skip over that for some reason. I, yeah, I guess because right. I'm so eager to talk about so many of these movies. But yeah, love I, movies. take it away, Chad. Yeah, so, go for it. I, I get it, bro. Um, yeah, so I don't have much here for – I have a lot for movies, not much for births, deaths, and I, I still have the 10 albums. But births, I have uh, Lil Nas X, uh, <laughs> Old Town Road, uh, Joey King, Cameron Boyce, and Lily Rose Depp. Uh, were all I could find for that. And then for deaths, I have the great, I don't know, maybe not so great in some ways, Stanley Kubrick. Um, Joe DiMaggio, I think that's an important name to Dylan. Um, Fred Trump, you know, it it is what it is. Uh, Dusty (laughs) Springfield, Jell Silverstein, George C. Scott, Curtis Mayfield, DeForest Kelly, if you're a Star Trek. Um, And then uh, Gene Siskel. Uh, we, oh, yeah. we do some sort of form of uh, film criticism ourselves. So, yeah. you know, I mean, just... all film criticism, at least like shows like this and podcasts like this, like I think we owe a lot to Siskel and Ebert and like just that whole like back and forth, Definitely. thumbs up, thumbs down. Like that. I mean, they were the ones who kind of kind of came up with the whole like top 10 movies thing, like counting down a top 10 and they had an Oscar show. So uh, yeah, the, the, the rest in peace and rest in peace, George C. Scott too. Uh, a picture this winter here uh, for the hustler. Uh, and I'm sure we'll talk yeah. about him more. I mean, we're going to talk about him more, but I'm sure he'll win more here. Totally. Yeah. So the albums I'll get into, um, I have just a few on vinyl. Um, one of this I, is one of my favorite albums of all time, but I am not going to pronounce it correctly because it's Icelandic. Um, it is Agatis Birgen by Sigur Rós. Um, love that band so much. Um, we also have Play by Moby. We have um, Californication by the Red Hot Chili Peppers. We have, uh, let's see here, The Soft Bulletin by the Flaming Lips, one of the mm. best concerts Carrie and I ever went to. Um, we also have Emergency and I by the Dismemberment Plan, 13 by Blur. Summer Teeth by Wilco, Keep It Like a Secret by Built to Spill, 69 Love Songs by the Magnetic my, Magnetic Field, and American Football by American Football. Nice. Yeah, uh, lots of great music. And and now we can segue into the great movies because <laughs> I, I kind of jumped the gun there. Uh, so, Chad, keep going because uh, I'm sure you got a list here um, oh of notable movies, and then we'll kind of talk about our favorites. But uh, go ahead. I have a, a giant list because I was nine – so I was watching right. everything, even stuff that a lot of people were like, that's probably bad, or no one saw like, that. DCOMs? I, I have so many DCOMs on my list. I'm like, I have oh. one DCOM on <laughs> okay. here. I have two. Yeah, I have a lot of like kid kind of movies or just like really kind of dumb movies that I really like. And then just some that are just notable. So here we go. I'm not going to, I'm just going to rattle them off. 10 Things I Hate About You, Afterlife, American Pie, Analyze This, Annie, Any Given Sunday, Audition, Austin Powers, The Spy Who Shagged Me. Baby Geniuses, Being John Malkovich, Big Daddy, The Blair Witch Project, Blast from the Past, Blue Streak, The Boondock Saints, Bowfinger, Boys Don't Cry, Bringing Out the Dead, But I'm a Cheerleader, uh, Buena Vista Social Club, Cruel Intentions, Deep Blue Sea, Detroit Rock City, Deuce Bigelow, Male Gigolo, Dick, a movie Carrie really likes, Um, Dogma, Eyes Wide Shut, Existence, Fantasia 2000, Fight Club, Idle Hands, Inspector Gadget, Lake Placid, Life, Magnolia, Man on the Moon, a film Dylan really likes, Um, The Mummy, Muppets from Space, Wes Craven's Craven's Music from the Heart, 
Okay. Uh, <laughs> never been kissed. Notting Hill. Office Space. She's all that. Sleepy Hollow. South Park. Bigger, longer, and uncut. The Phantom Menace. Stir of Echoes. Stuart Little. Superstar. The talented Mr. Ripley. Tarzan. Teaching Mrs. Tingle. The Thirteenth Year. Is that decom? Uh, Varsity Blues and Wild Wild West. And I and I I saved some for Best Picture worthy. Gotcha. Um, well, I also am going to add, I don't know if uh, this is that year. I might have to double check now, but Xenon Girl, the 21st Century is also 99, I believe. Um, was it? So it wasn't 2000? That's that's what I had. I, it might have been like one of those things where it premiered somewhere else first. I, I love Xenon. Um, so but Zenon's yeah, that, that, that was the one I actually had down. 13th year, I, I did write down later. But uh, yeah, I think it's 99. Uh, it's January 99. So oh. it might have been oh. listed as 98, maybe. I don't know. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so many good ones. And you actually rattled off some uh, international ones that I forgot to write down because wikipedia is weird nowadays where you only can look yeah. at it by american but uh, afterlife is one of my favorite films of all time and audition is is so crazy and scary yeah, I, and, yeah. I have afterlife on criterion i just haven't gotten to it yeah. yet so um uh, but uh you said you said you have some best picture ones but i want to go over to carrie because you are our yeah. guest uh, are there any like best picture worthy 99 movies uh that you would like to bring up as like some of the best ever Oh, I don't know if any of these are best picture worthy. They're all just. If you think ones. they are, they are. That's what I'll say. Oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, they're all ones I just like enjoy and have a lot of nostalgia for. I would say one one that I think is best picture worthy is Galaxy Quest. Mm. Uh, that's um, on my list. Yep. That's probably the closest, actually, I would say to being best picture worthy. <laughs> um. I don't know. I have a lot though that I just like genuine like. Right I, okay, uh, cruel intentions. I had like a big obsession with that. Um, the Mummy, Big Daddy, The Blair Witch Project, Muppets from Space, Pokemon the first movie. Yes. <laughs> uh, Dick, like Chad mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, switching goals, which is a Mary Kate Nashley movie. Yes. The <laughs> yeah. Uh, Fantasia 2000, and you mentioned Xenon. That that wasn't on my list, but if it was in 99, then definitely Xenon. Love it, love it, yeah. Nice. Uh, Chad, you can rattle off yours now. What are, what are some of your best picture worthy 99 movies? This one's kind of a little bit of a joke, this first one, but, you know, I, I do love it. Uh, Mystery Men. Uh, Election. Mm -hmm. uh, Galaxy Quest I also had. Uh, the Matrix. The Straight Story, Dylan needs to watch that. I think he'd love it. Um, Toy Story 2 and October Sky. Nice. Uh, yeah, and I, I kind of put together my own five. Because like I said, I, I would sub some of these out for some movies. But like, I genuinely think that like, you know, there, there's a really good crop of films you could replace it with if those five movies don't come out per se. But uh, the five I put together, Toy Story 2 and Man on the Moon, uh, my favorite two movies of that year. I also had Afterlife. I did have Eyes Wide Shut. And I have... Um, oh, did I only write down four? Oh, because one of them is part of the slate. So I won't say it. But Being John Malkovich is also amazing. I, I love that movie as well. Um, but yeah, so many good movies in 99. I mean, there's just too many to name. Um, you know, I, I have a friend whose first movie he ever saw in theaters was Tarzan, which was in 99. So, um, you yeah, know, and then Pokemon, the first movie. Like, all these movies from uh, or like childhoods are so nostalgic. Uh, Mickey's Once Upon a Christmas was that year as well. Um, one important tidbit of trivia for, for Stuart Little M. Night Shyamalan wrote Stuart Little, and I don't think people right. realize that. Um, right. and he, so he did that and Sixth Sense in the same year, which is a big flex, I'd say. Um, so, uh, But those are the 99 movies we wanted to highlight because there are just so many good ones. Uh, but let's transition to these five movies themselves. Um, looking first at what was nominated, I always bring up this chart. Um, American Beauty kind of swept. It, there was no suspense on the night. American Beauty won pretty much everything going into it. Um, Green Mile was really not nominated anywhere but the Critics' Choice, so that was a surprise on the day when it got nominated. Um, what didn't get nominated but may have gotten nominated this is what i call the next one in uh if you look at that being john malkovich literally had every precursor and still didn't get in it was a best director mm -hmm. nominee at the oscars it won it was a nominee for screenplay it was nominated for the golden globe for best picture pga dga wga it was a critics choice top 10 film it was a baptist screenplay nomination a sag ensemble nomination and still didn't get into best picture and then sort of there's some other films that were like on the bubble like talented mr ripley got a bunch of precursors uh the end of the affair and the her 
Hurricane were Golden Globe nominations. Uh, Toy Story 2 actually won the Golden Globe for Best Comedy Musical that year before they had an animated category, so that's pretty cool. Um, Magnolia was also on the radar, obviously. Election, uh, Man on the Moon. So these are like the movies that were, if there were 10, um, we'd probably see five of these make it in. Uh, movies like The Matrix and Fight Club, like some of those big heavy hitters weren't really awards movies at that time. Um, but that would have been really cool to see like Toy Story 2 be like one of the first like animated movies nominated but eh, they only had five slots back then um but uh, the actual award ceremony itself uh, billy crystal hosted it he was a mainstay for the oscars there's really not a ton to say like nothing that was hugely uh notable in terms of like big records or anything but sam mendez was the sixth person to win best director on a debut film uh which is big um uh, kevin spacey became the 10th performer to win an actor for uh, to win an oscar in both lead and supporting not in the same year but he had already won supporting for usual suspects and now he just won lead for this one um and uh, oh this is a cool one john voigt um by virtue of her father john voigt's best lead actor win for 1978's coming home best supporting actress winner angelina jolie and voigt became the second pair of father-daughter oscar winners in history uh, oscar acting winners so again not in the same year but uh someone's daughter had won an oscar which was a pretty cool uh and oh another big uh historic uh landmark thing uh Haley Joel Osment became the second youngest uh actor to ever receive an Oscar nomination uh for best supporting actor sorry not for every, any category but just behind Justin Henry from Kramer versus Kramer so uh Haley Joel Osment was 11 and the record uh, I believe still stands with Justin Henry at the age of eight for that category uh there might be some younger I think Anna Paquin might have been younger in general uh Linda Blair I'm not sure but um yeah just pretty uh cool uh, tidbits there but nothing too iconic there's no oscar slaps that year or any uh you know will smith chris rock feuds or anything like that but um still a, a fun year especially with the century turn coming up but uh like why don't we get into these movies themselves like the five we're here to talk about and we're talking about the big one first uh at least the big uh winner of the night being the best picture winner american beauty so chad tell us a little bit of history about american beauty well, yep. Uh, I know Carrie's ready. She just upped her comfy game. So um, yeah. let's oh, yeah. get into them. Uh, <laughs> American Beauty, directed by Sam Mendes, written by Alan Ball, cinematography by Conrad L. Hall, music by Thomas Newman, starring Kevin Spacey, Annette Bening, Thora Birch, Wes Bentley, Mina Suvari, Peter Gallagher, Allison Janney, Chris Cooper, Scott Bakula, Sam Robards, and Amber Smith. Synopsis. An advertising executive has a midlife crisis and becomes infatuated with his daughter's best friend. That is right. Um, and I'm just going to get the elephant out of the room now um, in terms of a lot of the conversation, especially in the last like few years, about American Beauty has been centered around its lead actor. We're obviously here to talk about the movie, not necessarily the artist, uh, though with this movie in particular, it deals with themes that are very real life parallel to the actual events. So um, again, no one will be judged for thinking less of the film because of those things, but also no one will be judged for avoiding those things when they're, you know, watching the film. We're all different people. We all watch films differently. And if that real life context slips in, then it slips in. Um, you know, we're only people and humans. So we watch films differently, but I wanted to express that because I do think a lot of people, you know, are, you know, shamed for thinking lesser of this movie because of the real life events, but also some people are shamed for saying, oh, the real life events should have no bearings on this movie because it is hard when the subject matter is so close. So I just want to say that before we get comments and comments about why aren't you addressing this? Why aren't you addressing this? Because that's mm -hmm. not what we're here to talk about, though this film in particular does kind of deal with, um, you know, uh, the age gap kind of thing so mm -hmm. it's a little different in this circumstance than something like a licorice pizza or something like that where there is no real life thing to attach it to but um that was just to get a disclaimer out of the way but um sure. uh yeah have you guys you guys had seen this one before had, had you guys seen oh carrie this is the first watch so i'll turn yeah. it to carrie first uh what, what do you think of uh american beauty um i was really surprised i enjoyed it a lot um I think I had gone into it, you know, just, I didn't know very much about it, but I knew part of the plot was that Kevin Spacey's character um, falls in love with a teenager. Uh, so I kind of went into it and I wasn't sure how it was going to be framed in the movie, if it was going to be framed as like this thing where um, it's kind of framed as like, you know, a good thing or like not not a bad thing or something mm -hmm. um so i was like really pleasantly surprised by this movie 
Um, you know, I thought the acting was absolutely phenomenal and just almost every shot in this movie is just so well constructed. Um, the dialogue and the screenplay is fantastic. Uh, so yeah, I was, I was honestly so surprised at how much I enjoyed this movie. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Chad, what, what are your first initial thoughts on uh, American Beauty? You had s seen this one before? Oh yeah. I've seen yeah. this quite a few times. Oh, okay. Um, just over the years, I had always been like interested in it for some reason you know i i like thor birch from like you know uh, hocus pocus and mm -hmm. um stuff like that so which is awesome but also a little weird <laughs> if you watch yeah. them back to back because you're like yeah. i i i don't yeah. know it's, it's oh, kind of it like, it's very you, weird. like when you're a kid you don't want to like walk in on your your siblings or parents doing anything it's kind of the opposite end where like i don't want to see this little kid grown up doing these grown up things yeah. um but hey that's just again that's like just the viewer in me like if i'd watch this one first who knows but i grew up on hocus pocus so that those scenes i i, I honestly can't watch them but gotcha um yeah i've i'd always been um interested in um in the movie so i i always wanted to watch it and I, I watched it before the world knew about Kevin Spacey and I've watched it after, um, you know, most recently, you know, here, yeah. <laughs> um, it's not like I've sought it out, you know, too much, um, after the fact. Um, but for watching it for this, um, I was wondering if I would like it as much as I used to. And, and I really do. Um, I'm on the same page as Carrie. Uh, I think this is cause I know Dylan really likes to read screenplays. I think this is like one that you can read and go like, well, this might be perfect. This is like really up there as like one of the great, uh, screenplays. And I think, um, because Sam Mendez is such a great director, I think he just really turned it into a fantastic movie. I have no qualms with it winning, um, best picture. I think it deserves it. Um, you know, I think maybe some of it might be a little bit of its time, but like, Honestly, I, I still think it holds up quite a bit. Um, I love like all, all of the arcs um, of the characters, all the stories of the characters are a little bit separate, but then they all like converge towards the end in this like really like satisfying way, but like an epic conclusion. Um, you know, we, we will spoil the movie now. Um, so, you know, if you haven't seen American Beauty, pause, go watch it. And then, you know, or not, I don't know. And then, or just be spoiled if you don't want to watch it, you know, but, uh, you know, Kevin, Kevin Spacey dies. So like in, in that, um, ultimate like convergence, you know, all this stuff is coming together. I just, I just think it all does it in a very satisfying way. And like all of the characters, um, stories are, are very different, but it's all like, you know, thinking about life and, you know, someone's having a midlife crisis and stuff like that. And, um, I actually love the way this happens and I forgot um, how well and how progressive the movie actually ends up being is because you're watching this movie and you do feel weird. You feel gross when you're watching him. I don't say falling in love with Mina Savara's character, but just oddly infatuated with her. Like, you know, Ooh, like who's that girl? Like I, I really like, uh, you know, her, you know, I can easily, you know, uh, probably get her over my house or something like that. Very problematic in the, in the beginning for sure. Um, but when he actually gets the chance to do something about it, you know, he, he, he sees that all the talk that Mina had had through the movie saying like, you know, I've been with all these people and just trying to talk herself up as, you know, this big important person who's just so experienced and stuff like that. You find out that she's not, and that she's really, she's never, had sex before and then that right then is when it clicks for him and he's like this is a child <laughs> this is not like some you know lustful fantasy anymore this is a child and it hits for him and i'm like i i love that arc for him because you know i feel like if it would have not ended that way then it would have definitely been gross and i think the movie would have suffered for it but i think the movie's progressive because of that where it's like you know reframing it and the character has kind of kind of a um satisfying arc um so uh yeah i'll let dylan talk now <laughs> yeah no, I, I feel really bad because i i i mean i, I won't hide it i despise this movie with almost mm. every fire fiber of my being because i for me it's it's not oh she's underage it's she's a virgin and that's the reason why and and i think personally like i i get what you're saying too it's like the her being a virgin kind of clicks that light bulb that she is underage but i don't necessarily know like 
it's not the fact she's underage that stops him. It's the fact she's inexperienced that stops him. Now she was an inexperienced college girl, like fine. Um, but I think the problem is setting it in high school and making her younger. And, and for me, that's always been icky. And, and again, like I put that disclaimer earlier because I am one of those viewers who just like, when the movie's so blatantly about that, it's hard for me to separate it. And it's, I, I try not to, but it's like, I, I just, I can't even watch those scenes. And you're right. It's meant to be uncomfortable, but I don't think the movie does a good enough job justifying it at the end. And I think it's all from his perspective, which makes it hard. I think if you were getting it mostly from a different character's perspective the whole time, and I do think the movie's stronger when it is from Annette Benning's perspective, when it's from Wes Bentley's perspective, I think Wes Bentley and Annette Benning are great in this movie. Like, I think the problem is so much of the movie is from his lens that I kind of struggle. I'm like, if you're watching this and you are kind of like a problematic person who is pedophilic, is this movie enough where you, if you watch it, are you going to walk away from it being like, yeah, you're right. That's wrong. And I don't necessarily know if that's the case. Now I'm not, and I don't know any people who are thankfully, at least I don't know. And I, so I don't know. I've never talked to anyone with that point of view, but I just, I just don't know necessarily what the lesson to be learned is from this movie. And if it is just don't, sleep with people because they're underage that's not necessarily what the movie says the movie says don't sleep with people who haven't had sex before and 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 again you could take away a different message from it but i i struggled to find exactly what the movie's trying to tell me from kevin spacey's character um and and i will agree on the fact uh i forget which one of you said this uh, how beautifully shot it is like i do think sam mendes has a really good like visual eye and the fact that this is a debut like i just said like he was the sixth person ever to win on his first go like for a debut film this is a really interestingly crafted film it just i think it i don't know i just i struggle with the subject matter in general to where it makes me feel uncomfortable but not in the way that i feel like at the end i'm like oh i learned a lot from it it just kind of leaves me feeling very icky afterwards and i do think on repetition with view another view because this is only the second time i watched it the first time i watched it, it was in high school and i love this film and that's I, also an interesting context because i was worried that the real life stuff would be what switched me on the film but I think it's more so when I was a high schooler, it's a little different because you, me as a high school was like, oh my God, these pretty high school girls. Whereas now I'm an adult, I'm like, oh, it's a little icky for me. And I, I just don't think that I connect to this one and I really get much out of it. And I also find some of the writing, I think the dialogue is good, but I think over, there's a little bit too much of that like blatant metaphor like the plastic bag and the wind stuff like that to me is a little film schooly like oh like this great idea but then it's beaten to death too many times and i think it's really interesting because i did love this movie once and now i don't i really don't know why i don't and i think it just might be different perspectives because i'm also not a teenager i'm also not in the midlife crisis stage of my life either i don't have kids i don't you know so i don't know like maybe my perspective percept perspective will change with age maybe it won't uh and i think a lot of it has to do with just the point of view of who we're following in the movie and that we're hearing everything through his narration his point of view like we're hearing his inner thoughts and it's it's icky and yes he gets shot at the end but it's you know it's meant to make you feel a little sad for him but i i don't think we should feel sad for him like yes he goes through growth but if he had just said no you're too young then I might have respected the film more, but the fact is, oh no, you've never done this before. I don't want to be the one to take your virginity. It's less about the age than it is the act of. At least that's what I interpret it from. Um, so it's it's very interesting to hear vo ver uh, different perspectives. And I'm not saying you guys are wrong for liking it. Obviously, most people do like it because it won. Um, so I'm I'm very much in the minority. Um, but yeah, I, I just I, I really don't love this film, and and I'm not a Sam Mendes diehard either. Like I've only liked one of his films, and that's Skyfall. So like I'm also coming from the perspective of I don't think he's as good as others say. So that might also have a you know part to do with it. Um, but we will talk about another movie later where I didn't like it, and now I love it. So sometimes things change for the better, and I'm glad that this one got worse and the other one got better because I think the other one is is you know one that I will continue to watch and enjoy. Whereas this one, I'm like it doesn't make me as upset because I still like some other films in this slate. I don't know. It's, it, I'm, I struggle with this film and, and it, I'm still trying to come to terms exactly why. Um, but yeah, just, it, it makes me uncomfortable, but not in a satisfying way. And, and also the Chris Cooper character, uh, that trope of, Oh, he's being homophobic because he's closeted. I just feel like that's like a lazy trope in, in, in a lot of things, but also again, like I'm coming from a world where I've seen it and other things that came after it. So maybe at the time when it was introduced, maybe it wasn't more, you know, enlightening thing, but it's also like, 
no, you shouldn't be a homophobe because you're closet. I don't know. Uh, it gives it, it gives a bad impression, I think, of homosexual culture. But I don't know. And again, I'm not gay, so I don't I don't have that lens either. It's like a lot of these things that I have criticisms of. I don't feel like I'm the right person to speak on because I don't have the relatable experiences. But you know, I, I don't know. It, it, it's it's interesting, and I, I hate that I hate it because I want to love it. <laughs> I really do because ever so many people do, um, and I did used to. That's what's so wild. Um, but yeah, no, I'm not I'm not a fan of it. But hey, that's our show. We 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 differ in opinions sometimes. But I'll let you respond because I don't you know I don't want to end on that bad note. But <laughs> yeah, um, I'll just. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Did you want to go? Oh, no, you go ahead, Carrie, please. Oh, um, and Dylan, I totally think like, I think your interpretations are totally valid. And like, um, you know, I think Chad and I get got something a little different out of it. Um, I'll say specifically where the scene where, um, you know, Kevin Spacey is, you know, starting to undress Mina's character. Um to me, I, I definitely took the same interpretation as Chad, where he realizes that she's a child. I do definitely see, though, like, I think you have a great point about the fact that it's, you know, he realizes that even in my interpretation, he realizes that because she says she's a virgin, like they could have maybe did something different to indicate that he, you know, it's whether it's I mean, and it could be maybe the intent was that it's totally possible the intent was like he didn't want to go through with it because sure. of the virginity. I'll say I took the child aspect, particularly because of the aftermath of that scene. Right. Like he puts a blanket around her and I think he like makes her a sandwich and like mm -hmm. he starts, I think, treating her a little like his daughter's friend and not yeah. um, a sexual object like he's been treating her the entire movie. And I think the events of that night both... Um, what happens with her and then what happens with Chris Cooper's character, I think something in him kind of like breaks and realizes he's just been acting like an insane, horrible person, like, mm -hmm. you know, throughout this entire movie. And then I think, but instead of moving forward along that path, um, you know, with the lessons he's learned, he dies at the end. So I do get what you, you, you're saying, Dylan, about like, what is the meaning of this right. movie <laughs> uh what are you supposed to take right. away from it um the that's a good point i mean I, it's hard i would say it's kind of like like this is showing like kind of i don't know I, i'm not actually no, gonna try to do a metaphor a on this I, know, stuff, yeah. I think it's like the same as the plastic bag metaphor like you know this pile of trash <laughs> right right yeah and, and that's the thing it's yeah you make a good point too and, and and even through talking about it i don't hate it as much as i did an hour ago you know what i mean like i've at least gotten to see another perspective where i'm like okay i can see where y'all are coming from and, and, and that's fair and again like it won so i'm not you know i know i know i'm in the minority which is fine and, and you know, i'm not going to change because it won best picture either but you know. And I do, I do think you have a good point about Chris Cooper's character. I do think that was a little bit more original for that time, right? Um, and maybe just a little bit disconnected from the view. You know, I think um, the voices of gay people are a lot more uh, uplifted and paid attention to in our society today. And maybe back then, people just didn't have, you know. It's great of an understanding. I do like that we actually do have in the in the movie there is as a counterbalance like a healthy gay couple in the movie. Yeah. And that's to right. me, to me, Chris Cooper's character says more about like masculinity in our society yeah. Yeah. and like the military mindset than like, you know, if you're closeted, you know, you have to hate gay people or something. Right. And I almost wish they had not saved it for a reveal then at the end, maybe mm -hmm. like have it revealed earlier that he's closeted, like, and then watch him kind of come to that discovery and learn more. Cause now, then it just comes out of nowhere. And then it's like, and then the movie ends. Like it, yeah. that's my thing with the Kevin Spacey thing too. It's like, let him have this realization with this younger girl and then let see a little bit of that growth more than just, Oh, put a blanket over and then boom, get shot in the head. You know, I, I think it just rushes at the end too much. It kind of reveals a lot. It, it does a lot of twists and turns at the very end and then it just kind of ends. And it's, I yeah. wish there was a little bit more of a third act past that. Like I wish that was kind of the beginning of the third act then where we can get this growth. And I get it. It's shock value too. Like the, the, the shot at, at the end is, is quite shocking. Um, so it, it's effective in that way, but, um, yeah, 
Chad, uh, what, what do you have to say? Yeah. Um, so basically, <laughs> I can um, tell you're angry at me. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm just like, okay. I have a lot to say. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, okay. This is basically, I feel like, you know, uh, my JFK where I, you know, I'm like, this is, right. you know, <laughs> probably going to be your five and I don't know if it'll be my one, but we'll see. It's definitely not going to be my five. I don't know. Don't say um, never say never. Oh. Okay. But you can sell me uh, right now. You can... <laughs> but, uh, I'm a shark tank should judge. Dude. Tell me the basically, product. you know, I, I actually do like the revelations in the third act. I think some of the best movies have great third act revelations, and you know, you don't really need much after that to see. Like, I think Harry like hit the nail on the head, basically talking about like the toxic masculinity stuff, where they're using he's using very strong language in the beginning, and then you're like, you know, uh, you want, like why is he so like hardcore about it? And you know, the son feels a little differently and you know and then you know he come comes at the end of, with the big surprise and um i actually really uh love chris cooper in that movie and that performance he's also oh, yeah, his performance is very very good very um good. and i just like the the writing of the character too because i can see a lot of people relating to these types of homes where you have just one domineering figure because you can see where um uh, 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 uh allison janney's character like you know when uh, the son is leaving, you know, he's like, you know, I, I really wish things would have been better for you. But this one person who's just so self-destructive because he's so self-hating that, you know, his whole family's being torn apart and no one's really happy. Um, and uh, I think that's kind of the thing is that, you know, people shouldn't, you know, get, you know, the, the, when the parents teach their kids that it's, it's wrong to be gay, what, what happens when someone is gay? Can they end up getting that drilled into their head that it's so bad, but then they are, and then they're self-hating and it's just mm. it's a very sad thing, but I think that happens. Um, you know, I don't think it's like something that they just wrote and it never happens. I think it actually does happen. And the thing is, is I actually really like, um, Kevin Spacey's character in the movie. Um, his whole character is like we, the whole time we've only been talking about his infatuation with Mina Savari's character. He has a whole Breaking Bad Walt, Walter White level epiphany where he just wakes up. It's kind of like Office Space the same year where he has an epiphany. Like I can do things differently. Like I felt stuck in my life and now I can start to change things. And unfortunately, the Mina Safari thing is like a part of that. Um, but I love how he starts to stand up for himself and starts to like work out and try to change himself and, you know, all this stuff, you know, thinking about life and like what it means and, and, and stuff like that. And there's a lot of movies that we watch. That's just about like, what's life. Can this thing over here be beautiful? Even if it's just a bag thrown around. Now I can see how people could say that's pretentious. That's yeah. meaningless. You know, that's how we, we, we look at art differently. And, you know, if, if you don't like the film, then maybe you'll be like, that's kind of pretentious, stuff like that. I can totally get that. But I do really like a lot of these characters. Um, I love Thor Birch's character. You know, she's very, like, goth and stuff and just, like, mm. goth, but not really actually going full goth. And I like her relationship with Wes. They both feel kind of like outsiders. You can see how Thor Birch's character, like, she's... Uh, her family's kind of falling apart. Like her mom's rushing home with a gun to probably kill her husband. Yeah. Um, at the end. And, uh, that's you know, a good, so I, I will say, cause I'm trying to think of positives and that, that kind of trick of you think she's going to be the one who shoots him. Cause yeah. do you see earlier in the film that he does die or no? You, he tells you that right. um, by so this time, it's going to be, or... yeah, you think it's going to be her who does it, but then it's not. I, and and the, I think that's a clever, that was a clever direction choice. Yeah. Yeah. And the cool thing is uh, you see all these lines converging at the very end and like two people have, or there's one gun and then she has a gun and then you hear the shot happen from different perspectives. And so her, when the shot happens, she's walking down the street, you hear it faint. And so I just thought like stuff like, like that was really cool. Um, but yeah, I think this is a movie that really, cares about its few characters and just really like dives into them. And maybe, I don't know if you, if like the, there's like an issue with the structure, I don't really have an issue with the structure. I think that's why I'm able to like this movie a lot more mm -hmm. and able to see a little bit more inside of Kevin Spacey's character. Although 
I've always been someone who can kind of just separate art from artists. Like I don't even think about anything Kevin Spacey real life while I'm watching the movie because I'm trying to get like lost in the movie. But I understand right. like a lot of people can't do that. Right. And for this and, movie specifically, like for Usual Suspects, which we won't talk about because I was criminally snubbed. But like that like movie, I'm never thinking, oh, Kevin Spacey sucks because like there's nothing that would ever like give yeah. me that thought. But in this one, when it's directly dealing with kind of what he was ultimately arrested for like that that to me is what's tougher but but i agree like i i actually really love the scene where he becomes the drive through um yeah food attendant or whatever and <laughs> and his wife pulls up to it. it it felt very walter and skyler that moment yes um like that that alone and, and you make good good comparisons i think also bringing bad the 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 good thing about it and and we'll end on positive is that like you have that really like long five five kind of six season journey to get there and you also never really have that moment of redemption for him because it is literally breaking bad and they don't try to i think that's the thing is like obviously this isn't a series and there's no redemption for him really i mean there's a little bit at the end but it's it's very small and, and short you know it just doesn't have time to really have a redemption which is the difference but i do agree in in terms of like the kind of the marriage falling apart and him kind of descending into something different and it, the midlife crisis literally driving him to evilness, but yeah, no, that's a good point. I, I like the comparison though. The the fast food scene definitely made me think of like something Walt would do for Sky yeah. with Skyler, um, with Ted is his name. The the guy that's oh yeah. yeah 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 oh Ted. <laughs> and yeah, I, I sorry for you know if I got got annoyed, but I'm just no, it wasn't annoyed. You're just fa your face got a little redder, and I could see you heavy breathing, and I was like, oh no. But no, again, like like you said. That was me for West Side Story and for JFK. This is American Beauty and Promising Young Woman. It's like sometimes, you know, that that's why I love having Carrie here too, because it's like, you know, it kind of gives you more validation in that respect. And maybe there's going to be another movie that you hate that Carrie could back me up on. I don't know. Um, no, but it, it's it's fun uh, having multiple perspectives. I won't I won't dive into the spoiler here, um, but um, if if you do end up checking out this month's Frame Wreck, there's another one that two people not ganged up on, but uh, absolutely loved that. Right, that you didn't. did not. Yes. Um, oh, sorry. So I'm, not, I'm just trying not to be very specific. Oh yeah. The one, yeah. the one you guys had number one, I think that's the worst movie. And, and, and the thing is, the thing is, Chad, you said this great on framework because they've already seen framework by then. We won't say what the film is or who thought okay. what, but well, we'll say that you were the one on the other side, but you, said no i'm glad you guys like a movie and that's kind of how i feel i'm like i'm glad you all love a movie i listen i wish i could love every movie because yeah. i i genuinely and i used to and the problem is i used to love this if i had never had any opinion of it and watched it and hated it, i'd be like whatever but the fact that i used to like it and then all of a sudden i'm watching it i'm just like i'm hating every second of it i really don't know it's it's more like i'm perplexed and i have no idea what to what to mm. do I'm, I'm kind of frazzled but i will say from here on out like i don't really have anything like terribly negative to say about anything else so like i'm glad this is first because like if this had been last because i west side story was the last one of our 61 so like I, i'm like i'm glad we're starting with this divisiveness because then later yeah. on it might get better but i don't know maybe you all will hate something i love so we'll, well <laughs> i mean i was truly uh i i was truly uh i didn't know where you were going to go with this because i could mm -hmm. see you being such a screenwriting fan you know, absolutely loving it. And then I know like, you know, how you feel about Kevin Spacey, how everyone should feel about Kevin Spacey. I don't want to, you know, get that out of the way, but um, I knew that you might hate it. Um, but I just didn't know like to what severity, but I will say real quick, I am very uh, surprised and I love that Carrie ended up, uh, you know, actually really liking it because I, I knew, she might if she gave it a chance. Yeah. Um, I, I literally went into it thinking I was going to have the same appeal and yeah. opinion as you have, Dylan. Right. Like, well, because I'll be honest, out there on the internet even, it's, it's still divisive. You have some people who are saying it's like the greatest movie ever made, and then you have other people saying like it is awful. Um, and there's some people who are in the middle who are like, I see the problems, but I still like it. Or I don't really like it, but I still respect certain elements of it. And I'm kind of like in the three quarters like i'm not like this is the worst movie ever made because there are movies that are like legitimately like 
problematic. There's movies where people actually shoot animals for real. There's movies where people go wear blackface. Like there's those movies are the ones that I think are like genuinely problematic and should not be shown, period. Whereas this one, at least like I think there's at least a conversation to be had like we just had. And I think that's kind of some of the best films, even if I don't like it. I'm glad it can lead to conversation and like at least getting to see other angles of it. which is And cool. unfortunately, Dylan, because we're not going in chronological order, we still have some of those movies we're going to watch on this show. So yep. Yep. we'll we get will. there. We will. We will get there. But uh, American Beauty was uh, the winner of Best Picture, but it won five awards out of the eight it, it was nominated for. It kind of cleaned house. Uh, it's yeah, it, it won the most of the night. Uh, it won Best Picture, won Best Director for Sam Mendes, Best Actor for Kevin Spacey, Best Original Screenplay, Best Cinematography. It was also nominated for Best Actress for Annette Benning, Best Original Score, which I do like. I think Thomas Newman's score is great. Is it Thomas Newman? Yes. Yes, yep. it is. It sounds very Finding Nemo. It's always Sam Mendes, Thomas Newman. Yeah. No, it always it sounds yeah. so Finding Nemo in some some areas, and and that's a good thing. And, and film editing. Um. So yeah, th this movie, Chad and Carrie think it rules. Uh. But does the Cider House rule? We're gonna find out right now. Chad, tell us. Does the Cider House rule? What is the Maybe Cider not. House? I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. The Cider House rules. Uh, directed by Lassie Halstrom. Uh, written by John Irving, cinematography by Oliver Stapleton, music by Rachel Portman, starring Toby Maguire, Michael Caine, or Michael Caine. Uh, I said that for Alan to, to make him mad. Um, Charlize Theron, Paul Rudd, Delroy Lindo, er, I'm sorry, Eure er, Eureka Badu, Heavy D, K. Todd Freeman, Kieran Culkin, and Eric Per Sullivan, a.k.a. Dewey from Malcolm in the Middle. Uh, synopsis homer is raised in an orphanage where he's taught how to perform abortions and he does but doesn't feel prepared to take over full time until he decides to journey outside of the orphanage based on the cider house rules by john irving yeah i had two thoughts as you were rattling off the cast list one the fact that someone's name is Heavy D, I mean, that takes a lot of confidence. Two, when you said the Malcolm Kaid thing, I think it's funny that like we keep impersonating his name in a British accent. When and I texted Chad this, I was like, the most jarring thing in this whole slate was like five seconds in, and he starts speaking. I'm like, oh, who's this? And then it's shown to be Michael Caine. I'm like, it, that Southern accent. I'm just like, I've never heard him talk any other way than that with his British accent. So I was just like, oh my god, it, it was just like one of those. What was it, Jim Broadbent in? Uh, one of those movies where I was like, oh my God, his accent, maybe Moulin Rouge or something like that, um, where it was just like, oh my God, the accent, it just like struck me by such surprise. Maybe it was a different movie. I don't know. But there was like a movie where we were like, oh my God, Jim Broadbent's accent. This is kind of where I feel like I, I just, that was the one thing I kept fixating on the first 30 minutes. I'm like, I got to rewatch this because now I've just, now <laughs> I've gotten that out of my system. But let's talk about the movie itself, not the accent. Um, uh, Chad, we started with Carrie. We'll start with you this time. Uh, what did you think of the Cider House Rules? This is a first watch for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. For me, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, this was interesting. I was wondering if I would like it because um, I really like Tobey Maguire. So I was thinking, you know, maybe that might be uh, something. I also really like Charlize Theron and Paul Rudd. Um, Michael Caine's cool, I guess. Um, oh, but um, yeah, I like, I like all those people. I love Dewey. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, uh, what, what happens to Dewey is very sad in this movie. Oh um, incredibly God. sad. Um, but, uh, yeah, I actually didn't know what this was about. Carrie and I bought cider, and they were like, wait, I guess it's a little bit about cider. They're picking apple. Yeah. You don't really yeah. show them making or drinking cider. You would that send much. me a picture, and I was like, uh. <laughs> That's why I asked you if you were watching in a drive-in, because I was like, that at least has a little bit more of a thematic tie. True. But it was still delicious, that cider. Um, and the movie was uh, maybe a little delicious. Um, I don't <laughs> I'm kind of like middle on this this one. I think it's, you know, I think it's good. Um, I like the uh, journey that Homer goes on. I like, you know, the that they all watch King Kong. And that's like the only thing that they watch um, at the orphanage. Yeah. And they watch it on like um, a projector too, which is so cool, which I guess very makes cool. sense given the time, but it, you know, I'm like, that's, that's dope. He's very like projector. cinema paradiso. Yeah. Kind yeah. Of, yeah. Um, but yeah. And then he goes on, on his journey. Uh, he is so infatuated with uh, Charlize Theron, um, but you know, she's betrothed to Paul Rudd. Although apparently that doesn't matter. He goes to war and she's like, you know, I got my needs or whatever. And um yeah, uh, Karen Culkin's really cool that he, that he's in this. A um, uh, little bit of a bridge between Home Alone and Scott Pilgrim. Um, and then, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, But, uh, yeah, um, 
I don't know. Like, I feel like it's just weird that the title is the Cider House Rules because I feel like they don't really talk about the rules that much. Yeah. I guess it's because the book is called Cider House Rules and maybe they get more into the rules, what they are, and, you know, what it means to everybody, like the people who didn't consent to the rules because, well, they couldn't even read the rules, so they just kind of disregarded the rules. Um, you get into you actually get into uh, some real kind of um, sexual assault and incest in, in this movie, which is, uh, you know, a little strange. Um, and, uh, and it also talks about abortion a lot, you know, which it, it feels like it's very, you know, pro-choice because, you know, Tobey Maguire and M Michael Caine uh, <laughs> do uh, abortions and, you know, he's, learning how to do them. And then when one is apps, you know, I guess needed, um, you know, he's, he knows how to do it uh, safely and, um, and everything. Um, and, you know, there's consent there to, to do it and, and all that. And um, yeah, um, it, I'm trying to like put it. It's, it's tough. Yeah. There's, it's there's tough a lot of about, yeah. threads, but I do ultimately like his journey because he's like, I can't, I don't want to do this. I don't know if I agree with it necessarily. And even like Charlize Theron has an abortion. She kind of doubts whether she made the right decision, which is really sad, especially, you know, us having a, a child now um, it, it framed a little bit differently, even though I'm still pro choice and, mm -hmm. and all that, you know, still, you know, a little bit sadder um, to, to think about. Um, and then he doesn't initially want to do them. He does one. And then he, goes off to gain some more experience and then he comes back and he takes over the um orphanage or not takes it over but you know leads it i guess after michael kane dies of an ether overdo overdose and i still don't know what ether is but yeah i don't know it's not the thor ether is it the thor of the dark world ether? <laughs> no, the ether <laughs> this is an mcu film we just didn't realize um yeah carrie what were your thoughts on on this one yeah, um, I guess I feel kind of similar to chat. This was a little middling for me. Um, there were parts about it I really, really liked. Um, I really thought the overall message was very, like, very important. Like, I think this movie is great at showing uh, why we need safe abortion access. Um, you know, not that it... I mean, it should, I don't want to, I shouldn't get too far into it, but it, it's, I think it's, it shows, you know, kind of why there's a need for it. I like that Toby Maguire's characters, um, you know, we kind of see him journey from, he refuses to do the abortions in the beginning and he doesn't, he seems like he doesn't want to take over for Michael Caine because he knows this is a part of the job and he doesn't necessarily agree with it. And then we kind of see his journey and, um, you know, how he truly learns how some of the circumstances in the world are. Um, and uh, and you, so you I, also, I was just going to add, you also get to see that um, when an abortion uh, or someone who doesn't go through the, the uh, safe process of abortion, a woman dies because of um, unsafe stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and we also see kind of the aftermath of, um, you know, children who don't have homes. Um, you know, they're in the orphanage and they're yeah. together and they seem happy, but, uh, you know, they are also wishing for their own families. Um, so, I, yeah. I don't know. I guess what I'm trying to say is, <laughs> well, it's, it's, I don't know. I'm trying to put it together in my mind. Yeah, it's um. Well, yeah, you it's, know. A, it's a very I don't want to say disjointed film, but it kind of just like it's like once one chapter's over and it goes to the next, it's kind of just a different movie. You know, it's like uh, yeah. I guess there are through lines, but it's like this is about Tobey Maguire, an orphan who was never adopted, growing up through the orphanage and and his journey with that. And I think that's actually probably the most exciting or interesting part of the film. And then the next one is like, oh, now he's with Charlie Stern and they're falling in love. And then, oh, the Delroy Lindo character. It's almost like little chapters. So mm -hmm. it's hard to kind of like talk about it as a whole. Also, I agree. Like, it's a little middling in the fact that like, when we're talking about best picture, like this is one of the best picture nominations. We talked about all the movies that didn't make it. Toy Story, uh, The Matrix, 10 Things I Hate About You, Xenon Girl is 20 whatever century. Like when you're looking at this compared to all those movies, it's like, it's weird to think that like this was one of like the five best. Um, and like, I get it. It kind of fits like the, 
kind of Oscar bait mold of like, you know, it's got the tear jerking moments. It's got the sweeping score, good cinematography, good performance. But like, I do think it's like, yeah, like there's not a lot to talk about because it is just kind of like, I don't want to say basic, obviously, because it does talk about interesting things, but it doesn't feel as revolutionary as even uh, like, I don't love it, but American Beauty, like there's clearly something in all the other four films, I think that are at least kind of more, you know, some there's stuff we've never seen before. Whereas here, I didn't think anything surprised me in that way where, where I agree with you. Like, I don't, I don't think there's a lot even more I can talk about because like there really isn't a lot that's polarizing in either direction, good or bad, you know, just kind of like Carrie said, middling. Um, which sucks because, you know, there's so many good performers in this thing and Michael Caine won the Oscar for it. And and that's another thing too. I feel like Michael Caine for winning the Oscar, I was expecting him to be in a little bit more, uh, but it is a supporting role. But like, I feel like once Toby leaves the orphanage, it's like he has maybe one or two more scenes and that's it. Like, I feel like I would have liked a little bit more from Michael Caine in his overall journey um, because his character is very fascinating because he's not always the nicest guy. He's not always like, you know, he's very straight. He's got some problematic views at times, but it, but he is a very interesting character. So I honestly think his character is even more interesting than Toby. So I would have liked to spend a little bit more time with him, especially knowing he won the Oscar for it. Uh, and it is considered a heralded a great performance. So um, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> this might just be one that is kind of of its time. And also it, it just feels like one of those, like another Toby film that we've covered that I feel like neither of us loved uh, was Seabiscuit. Oh was yeah. Another one that we're that. like, this feels like I could see where it's going. I could see why people maybe of the time would go great movie, but then you like look at it and you go, maybe this is more by the numbers than I thought, you know, it, it was initially, but you know, f- since we're now in 2023, I guess we can look back at this and go, I've seen better kind of a deal, you know? Yeah. And I feel like he goes to even larger, like emotional depths in, in the Spider-Man movies. And usually it's the opposite. Usually it's like the comic book movies are all fun, but then like a lot of the prestige Oscar films where you see like an actor act. And it's like, this is the opposite where it's like, no, this is a good performance. It's fine. But then when you see him in Spider-Man, it's like really good. And like even Babylon, which isn't like emotional, it's like still like a fun, fun performance. It's different. He's doing like something comedic which i feel like we rarely see with toby so like yeah like this and seabiscuit is just kind of like he's toby he's doing the toby thing <laughs> and speaking of acting you get to see a, a a much uh better uh grown more experienced now paul rudd than you do in the curse of michael Myers. <laughs> i knew you were gonna mention that too uh, <laughs> but we barely get any time with him either i i honestly kind of yeah. like the dynamic of paul rudd charlie's throne and toby and then they send paul rudd and i'm like oh this is gonna be a romance and it's like I also have a thing with infidelity in movies or, you know, I'm just like, ah, just like, why, why she was happy with him. Right. No, I don't know. Well, I mean, you, you have that in a lot of the war movies, like the thin red line, you had stuff like that. And right. You know, like yeah, it was... off the war and then just like, well, you know, they're yeah. cheating. Probably because it's Paul Rudd. It's like, he's such a nice guy, you know, yeah. <laughs> but so is Toby. Yeah. But... How could you cheat on Paul Rudd? Right. That was my whole thing. I'm like, really? Charlize is going to, I don't know. I, I shouldn't say Toby's not as good as Ball Rub, but it's like you got everything you need. I don't know. I guess I don't know. I, I'm, I've never experienced that. Again, well, I don't also, have the personal experience to. to, to you get. don't. You don't know. Maybe. Maybe she was in the mindset of he might die over there. That's it's a True. world war he's going to. So. True. True. It's a yeah, time where's, where's here. Toby's? Toby's here. He's here. The cider house. The drive-in. Um, sexy cider house, you know. Sexy cider house. Uh, it rules. Um, any, any, <laughs> any other thoughts on this one? I mean, it, it's hard because, yeah, Carrie. I just wanted to make clear when I was talking earlier because I feel like it might have sounded weird, but I, I didn't mean to say that orphans shouldn't, ex- like, exist or something. I don't know. It. No, I feel we, like, no, what? you did give okay. that impression. I promise. <laughs> well, you, you framed it as a. You know, this shows that, like, you know, orphans, um, you know, it's, it's sad when you just see orphans there and some of them just don't get homes. And it, yeah. hopefully that would drive more people out to want to adopt more orphans. Right. You know, uh, that is a, 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 a viable o- option for me um, mm-hmm. if I can't have children or if I just want to do good in the world i don't know but yeah well also yeah it's like an orphanage is a better home than no home like than right. you know, on the street and abandonment but it's still not a home it's a house not a home. right Type yeah. idea. you know this house is not a home this chair is not a chair or whatever i don't know the name of that song um, and 
Dylan, do you remember uh, the 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 quote? What quote? The quote is, "Good night, you princes of Maine, you kings of New England." There you go. I thought that was sweet, actually. Yeah, like yeah it's yeah. a nice little hook. It's got a good hook to it. Like again, like this movie's not bad. It's just like yeah. you know, with no, other movies yeah. in this slate in particular, and even outside of it, like the fact that The Matrix is not a best picture not nominee, and this is like, and I'm just not saying The Matrix is the best movie of 1999, but in terms of just what it did for genres of movies in general and stuff, like yeah. there's so many, even like fight club for someone i know chad you don't love fight club but like again like there's mo other movies that i think are just more interesting but i don't know and and i will say believe believe us if it was bad we'd say it because there have been bad movies we've covered on this show yes um the center <laughs> house rules uh, the oscars thought it was at least good enough for two oscars which is more than the other three films we're about to talk about next uh it wins for two out of seven it wins supporting actor for michael kane vocal guide or in this movie, Michael Caine, um, adapted screenplay. So uh, American Beauty wins original, this wins adapted. Uh, it's also nominated for Best Picture, Best Director for Lars Holstrom, uh, Best Original Score, Best Art Direction, and Best Film Editing. Uh, yeah, no, to, to go to war, you, you got to trek a long way, right? It's quite a few miles where Paul Rudd had to travel, right? I guess. Perhaps. And there was a lot of grass, I would assume, on the drive over to war. Uh, what color was it? You could say it was a green mile. <laughs> God, I, how do you segue? I mean, I guess orphanages <laughs> and prisons. I mean, even then, it's a hard segue. It's a hard one. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. You did the anyway, best. Anyway, let's green cry. Green Mile, yeah. directed by Frank Darabont, written by Frank Darabont, cinematography by David Tattersall. Tattersall. Music also by Thomas Newman, starring Tom Hanks, David Morse, Bonnie Hunt, Michael Clark Duncan, James Cromwell. Michael Jeter, Graham Greene, Doug Hutchison, Sam Rockwell, Barry Pepper, and Harry Dean Stanton. Synopsis, a prison guard who performs executions uh, witnesses supernatural events after the arrival of a new convict. Based on The Green Mile by Stephen King, which was a series of books put into one. Interesting. Uh, you guys had seen this one before, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I was the only one living under a rock because I remember on the Tom Hanks draft day, everyone was like, you haven't seen the green mile. And then for film off Crosby picked the green mile. I'm like, I've never seen it. He's like, you've never seen the green mile. And now here I am three times the charm. And, <laughs> and haven't seen it still. No, I, I <laughs> imagine. <laughs> imagine if I like just came here and was like talking out of my ass about it. I hadn't watched any of these movies. Um, no, it's funny because Chad was like, yeah, it's Frank Darabont. It's Stephen King. So I was expecting Shawshank 2.0, which like, you know, is not an unfair comparison in style, but it's very interesting because Chad even texted me. He's like, yeah, there's like a supernatural element. I'm like, really? I was like, in this movie? And then it happens. I'm like, whoa, it's like, this movie just was not what I was expecting. Like I was wow. expecting just like a regular prison drama because it's also three hours. So I was like, oh, this is going to be an epic long prison drama about how this man kind of learns that the death penalty is wrong by bonding with this inmate, which is a truth. That is truth. But yeah. I didn't realize how the bonding would be stemmed from this supernatural thing of showing quite literally showing that he was innocent, um, which, you know, is a very interesting choice. Cause I think a lot of movies like to make it ambiguous to an extent to like still leave the audience with the question of did he, or did he do it? It's kind of like the 12 angry men thing where it's like, they walk away with a verdict, but you still don't a hundred percent know the truth. But like, I like how this film does show the truth because it makes you empathize even more with the character. But like, I was not expecting all the supernatural shit and I was so into it. Like, I was so yeah. excited. And <laughs> for three hours, I, I was watching this and, and it was nearing the end. And I was like, oh, I probably have what, like two hours left? And it was like 30 minutes. I was like, whoa, <laughs> I only have 30 minutes left. This, Flies movie, by. this movie does fly yes. by. And, yeah. and that's a testament to pacing because it's not really an action packed movie either. Like, there's not a lot of action in it like there's stuff that happens but it's not you know it's kind of like Shawshank where y you blink and it's already at the ending and, and I think that's a testament to King's original source material Darabont's direction and obviously these performances and the way you're engrossed in the characters I mean um you know the only character I didn't like was Sam Rockwell but then by the end I'm like oh I'm validated yeah. in that <laughs> um, you know I'm like oh good good I'm supposed to not like him um and and, and I think yep. that's great because I'm like the whole time I'm like I really hope he didn't do it Michael Clark Duncan because he's such a sweetheart and I feel so bad and then and Chad and Carrie both know from our draft day a few months ago I hate mice 
And this turned me around on mice. I, I'm a mice. You love Mr. Now. Jingles. I, I, Mr. Jingles kind of turned my life around on mice. I, anyway, I've talked long enough. I've talked almost three hours worth, uh, even though the movie. Yeah. Anyway, I was trying to make a joke about the length of the movie, which flies by. Um, go ahead. Carry your chat. I talked about the green mouth. I freaking love it. Carry. Uh, ladies first. Yeah, I, I mean, I absolutely adore this movie. It's been so long since I've seen it, and I think I'd only seen it once before. So this was just an absolute pleasure to rewatch. Um, you know, I, I say a pleasure. They, there's so much right. difficult subject material in this. Um, this movie is so heartbreaking at times. Um, uh, but I... Again, I think the acting in this is just absolutely phenomenal from everyone. Um, even especially even Sam Rockwell, because I just I, I hate him the entire time he's on screen, but I'm like, he's doing such a good job acting. Yeah. He's, he's making me hate him. And it's not even like you hate him in the way that you're like, oh, I just like hate like it's annoying to watch it. And it is, but it's like you still want to see what's gonna happen with his character in relation to the others. It's not like one of those annoying performances where I'm like Oh, if they just cut this role out of the movie, it would have been so much better. Right. Obviously, you need this role for obvious reasons, but it's yeah. like he I, I'm still leaning in to see what drama is going to happen next because of him, which is a testament because a lot of the times annoying performances just make you want to shut it off. Whereas yeah. I'm leaning in. It's weird. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember. I'm pretty sure I've read the book before I watched the movie. Um, and this is like very true to the book from what I remember. It's been a while, um, but I, I, you guys have a good point about this movie does fly by. I didn't even think about that. There are shorter movies um, that we watched for this picture. This where I was like, "Oh my god, we have an hour left!" <laughs> like, yeah, a lot of um, lot of three hour movies in, in the best picture land. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This one, it, you don't you don't feel that length at all. I think mm -hmm. I think it's it's fantastic for actually fully telling the story and giving it the time it needs. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the supernatural elements aid in that a little bit too. Cause there's like this kind of, and that's when you said it's a pleasure to enjoy or it's a joy to watch. Like, I think that's fair because yes, it's hard to watch. It's sad. It's heartbreaking. It's on every watch mojo top 10 for saddest mo movie moments, but it also, because of the supernatural stuff, it kind of adds that levity you need. Because if it's if there's not that supernatural element, if it's just this hardship, like it might be a slog, it might be tough to get through. Um, and you know, we'll talk about Schindler's List someday, but like, you know, that's a movie where there's not a lot of levity, but it's still a masterpiece. But there's a lot of movies where there's no levity and it does drag because there's not. So I think that does add the levity of the supernatural element. And there's like funny, they're genuinely funny yeah. characters in this thing. Like, I think, you know there's a lot of comedy sad it's sad to talk about in a movie about the death penalty but there's there's some good comedy yeah, yeah. and bringing up the death penalty this movie is a great example and this if you have any doubt this stuff innocent people are 100 executed in this country uh innocent people are jailed for life in this country um mm -hmm. it's been proven um so yeah oh what's his name the 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 asshole uh doug hutchison um the, the one who like doesn't oh. wet, wet the sponge. Yes. Oh, Eugene Tim. That whole scene <laughs> pissed the Tunes hell out the of me. Like that scene <laughs> pissed me off so much because oh, it, yeah. it's really like, and, and it's and it's sad that like their way of being nice about it is like let's wet the sponge so it's not painful for them. Where it's like, yes, that's a nice idea, but you're still killing them, you know. And and yes, some people do terrible, terrible things, but like jail is horrible as is. Like, and I think it's it's that idea of like, is that enough to like ingrain in someone how shitty of a thing they did and they learn from it? Um, or do we have to go that extra mile, no pun intended to do, you know, horrible things and end someone's life. And I never think death is justified. That's my own personal stance. I'm sure, you know, I, I think just from talking to you guys, you'd probably agree, but like, yeah, I, I just don't, I, I, that one scene pissed me off so much. Cause at least, at least give him the decency of wet in the sponge and, and he purposely, you know, he puts in the bucket, but doesn't put it in like that whole yeah. scene moment. Um, that that's probably my favorite, like stretch of the film is the stuff around. Um, what's his name? Oh my gosh. Uh, Mr. Noodle from Elmo. Uh, what's his Del? name? Dell. Yeah. Dell. Yeah. Um, all that stuff around Dell's character is just so like that whole sequence. It reminds me of Brooks and Shawshank where it's like, it's not the main plot of the movie, but that like little like 20 to 30 minutes where it's just kind of centered around him and that hateful guard who wants to do his execution and leave the prison or whatever. Like that to me is probably my favorite moment. Cause that's the one I'm most like 
emotionally responded to. But Chad, uh, I'll throw it over to you now. What, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, well, I do ha- have a lot of opinions on like the death penalty and, and how we treat prisoners just in general. Mm-hmm. Like, if you're going to have prisoners in a prison, treat treat them well. Make them like want to see human compassion and, and see you know, how they can be better. Lead by example. Don't treat them horribly because then they're just going to be the same people. You want them to change, right? You want them to get better? Or no, you just want to punish them. It, it shouldn't be a punitive thing. It should be more of a rehabilitation thing. And if we're going to the, the death penalty thing, uh, no. Uh, no, we are saying murder is wrong and it's illegal. Why should the state be able to murder someone? That makes no sense to me. Like, mm-hmm. that. I don't understand that quite a bit. And you can also see where, you know, I'll, I'll get into it just a little bit, say that, like, I I don't know how much the, the victims of a crime uh, ha- should have a say in something because they're extremely biased. They haven't looked at, at all the facts. They don't, they're not like the lawyers or the investigators that actually go into to the cases and stuff like that. And you can see in this movie, like, towards the end, you have all this um, information by be living with these characters and you can see the people at the ends when they are, you know, spoiler, uh, putting John Coffey to death. You have these people like, you know, fry them, you know, kind of a deal. And they're the victims. And you're like, well, they, of course they would say that because they don't have other information. They don't know that he's innocent. They don't know any of the stuff. But then you see Tom Hanks go and, um, you know, shake his hand. And it's such, such a harrowing, like sad, depressing moment. But I, I love this movie so much i think this is a beautiful beautiful movie um obviously i'm wearing a shawshank shirt and on our very first episode you know i put shawshank number one i just love frank darabont what he does with stephen king's material he's kind of like the other mike flanagan who's able to adapt his novels and stuff to the screen so well um and especially the, the prison stuff um but yeah i think you're you're right dylan the the thing that really hooks me into this is the supernatural stuff i love all the character stuff i love um you know the the arc of tom hanks and you know the arc of you know understanding that the death penalty is not a good thing and you can see because innocent people end up dying um because uh it's barbaric you know mm-hmm. there's no humane way to kill someone like even lethal injections have been shown to be very inhumane um and even like you like you alluded to dylan's or talked about saying that even wetting the sponge like so it kills them quicker it's still a very barbaric way to kill someone and we shouldn't even be killing them um um, in the first place you know that it's my opinion i'm very passionate about this i I think it's a very shitty thing that some places still do even states here i think still Mm -hmm. do that um, um, before you continue, one thing yeah. I want to piggyback on for something you said about, um, you know, when he shakes his hand and, and like everyone kind of uh, like cheering along, almost like it's entertainment, like they're watching a football game or whatever when someone's yeah. getting executed. The one thing about this movie that frustrates me is like, if he could touch Tom Hanks and show him the truth, why can't he just go around showing everyone the truth? Why can't he just touch everyone and be like, listen, I like that. But th- I get it. That's mm-hmm. that break the logic of the movie probably. But like, it's one of those things where like the logistics side of me is just like, if he can do it for one person, can't he just like go up to a judge or whatever at a court or a jury and be like, yo, look, <laughs> but maybe, I, I know that's not how it works. Maybe it has maybe to have it something. It, maybe it's explained better in the, in the book. Uh, yeah. Like maybe yeah. the rules of whatever John Coffey has is, but maybe he has to show someone who wants to see. Right. Who, like, wants to. So maybe you can like, just like kind of gleam that through, you know, right uh read between the lines kind right. of it's, it's kind of an annoying that, that's like my uh cinema sins like brain thinking yeah like, if he had just at the crime scene just been like wait 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 wait, wait. touch me touch me you'll see but i think part of it is to um john coffee in the movie he i i think um and this is i honestly to me the, the only part that bothers me a little bit because it is a little bit of a cop-out um for them not trying harder to prove his innocence but i think the prison guards are kind of like oh we need to like try to stop this and i think john coffee is like having this gift is just like so overwhelming and like yeah he says um, it's too much there's so much pain in the world yeah that's like a speech that he gives that i just like holy shit i just i just love everything with michael clark duncan and and john coffee and 
just like that character like he has this like amazing gift that does good in the world but he sees so much pain and like when he's doing the good he has to take a lot of that pain and internalize it and it's like he's a superhero that's what a lot like the the superman you know can hear all the pain around him so that's what my what makes him such an interesting character is because you know he's got all this hyper perception you know he can hear like the worst shit imaginable just Mm -hmm. right around the corner and john coffee internalizes that and i just think that's such a great like when you realize he can heal tom hanks and then they take him to heal that woman and just like these beautiful visions of these people getting healed and just living better lives because of it i just think is is so incredible but like also just the character of john coffee i think is so interesting because you know he's obviously not very educated that takes place back in the day where you know you could see a black man not being educated and misunderstood so much because he's a bigger guy and he talks very slow and Mm -hmm. you know and stuff but he's also one of the kindest souls i think ever in like film period just like that you can see it's like a a paddington through and through is john coffee and i just Oh man. And then every, we didn't even talk much about the mouse, even though you said you're a convert. Right. I love Mr. Jingles. <laughs> I love Dell. Um, I love all this. I, you know, and the sad part too, is at the end when you realize he's lived for like 108 years and he's like, I don't see an end in sight. I know it's going to happen, but I'm going to keep living. And you know, that, that whole thing where he passed uh, on the, uh, the thing to, to him a little bit. Um, and, and he saw it as, more of a curse than a gift like oh i have to yeah. see everyone i know die um and then mr jingles unfortunately isn't doing so hot at the very end either yeah well that's also like interesting because because i when i started it i was like wait is this like saving private ryan this old man he's gonna like reflect yeah. on this past story it, kind of similar framing device in yeah. that way um but at the end it's like much less about like you know it, it has less of a cheesy ending uh, no okay. pun intended because mice eat cheese um but like the ending of like him you know almost like it's a good thing like there's a sweet bond between him and the mouse but there's this underlying sadness of him having this gift now um yeah it's a very interesting ending like i i really loved everything about this movie like i really can't believe it's there's some movies that come along where i'm like i spent 25 years of my life not seeing this well i guess 24 because you know this came out a year past my birth but you know it's like really like oh i yeah. i, I it's that's hours and hours of my life I wasted. Yeah, and I, I will add because uh, you guys are talking about the pacing. Like this is one that Carrie and I did watch in sections. Mm. Um, a lot of times at night we'll throw in like our AirPods and and watch the Green Mile. But honestly, every single time I was very excited. I was like, Let's, "Can we watch more Green Mile, please?" Because this is incredible. Yeah. I, I love. I forgot how much I love that movie because I had seen it a lot uh, before, but it's been a while. Mm -hmm. And I remember when this was released, very, very similar to Titanic, released on two VHS tapes. Ah, nice. You had to, like, you know, pop one in after the other kind of a deal. Makeshift intermission. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Of course, please put intermissions in your movies. (laughs) Yep. Um, Any any other thoughts on The Green Mile? Um, It's It's amazing. Yeah, it is. Uh, the Green Mile. Unfortunately, the Academy nominated it the least of these five movies and uh, didn't nominate it for director either. But it did pick up four nominations. It picked up picture nomination, supporting actor, of course, for Michael Clark Duncan, uh, adapted screenplay, and best sound. Um, but, you know, if, if only one of us had just been part of the Academy that year and could have, like, helped kind of rig the uh, oh, yeah. the, the ballots, get it more some, some more nominations. If only one of us were an insider in the Academy, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know. if only. Uh, anyway, let's talk about another insider. Chad, tell us about The Insider. Oh, yeah, yeah, The Insider. Yeah. Um, directed by Michael Mann. Written by Eric Roth and Michael Mann. Cinematography by Dante Spinati. Music by Lisa Ger- Gerard and Pieter Bork. Starring Al Pacino, Russell Crowe, Christopher Plummer, Di- Diane Verona, Philip Baker Hall, Lindsay Krauss, Debbie... Mazar, Rip Torn, and Cliff Curtis. Synopsis. A whistleblower and a reporter struggle to give testimony of wrongdoing and against the efforts to suppress the testimony. Uh, Based on The Man Who Knew Too Much by Marie Brenner. Yeah, I still think they should have called this The Man Who Knew Too Much with two N's, man. 
because uh, <laughs> I don't know. I've always saw that. And I was like, oh, that would have been yeah, fun. Been um, yeah, very interesting because I think that that article, I guess, that, uh, that's based on the man who knew too much. Uh, that was very recent, I believe, right before the movie came out. It's one of those like dumb money things where this movie was, was like sped into production about it, um, which is why it's so interesting that there is such a long movie with so much to chew on uh, present. Like it, it's amazing that in, in just such a short amount of time, they have so much to work with. Um, mm. And it still doesn't feel like a dumb money thing where I, I don't know if you've seen dumb money yet, but it's I like, have. you know, it's almost too soon where it's like, we still haven't even kind of gotten out of this story. It's still kind of going on. Whereas here, at least it feels like it at least has an ending point where it's like, okay, this kind of makes sense to the end of this particular story, even though like, obviously you can continue on themes of this thing through still today um, in regards to journalism and the media and all that stuff. But um, it was just a first watch for all of us as well. This one. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Carrie. What, what were your thoughts on the insider? Um, yeah, this one. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the side. <sighs> and I was alluding to uh, there were uh, shorter movies in the slate that were a bit more of a struggle to get through. This was the one I was referring to specifically. Um, something about this movie for me just honestly didn't click. It was a little bit of a slog to get through. Um, I thought the subject matter was really fascinating, like to the point where I looked up, you know, more of the backstory of what happened. Um like in general, I thought the the plot was really good, and I guess I say plot. It's I I feel weird describing something as a plot when it's like based on a true story. It's right. like actual events that happened. Yeah, right. um, but I thought it was super interesting. That aspect was super interesting. I thought Al Pacino actually gave a really great performance in this movie. Russell Crowe for me, not so much. I guess maybe it just like seems so similar to his performance in a beautiful mind but mm -hmm. it's just a little it's not as it doesn't have kind of the charm of that performance i guess it wasn't unhinged enough for you I right think. well and that's what you're saying you see you just said the word un unhinged because it's like <laughs> russell crowe is still in his prime movie star era of like la confidential to like gladiator master of command yeah like like, like like that like six year stretch where he was like all his movies were nominated for best picture and he was nominated for all his movies whereas pacino is more of unhinged because he's kind of gone past his prime of the godfather dog day afternoon days and now he's in his like kind of next era i'm now this kind of older kind of more manic energy you know pacino a scent of a woman insider Heat. Um, heat insomnia like that era of Pacino, oh, where he's yeah. like in an older phase, phase of his life so it's very interesting to talk about like the two of them because we've seen pacino in his prime now this is more crow in his prime where pacino is now playing playing more of a character um because he's a much more showy individual so i yeah i agree like it's very interesting to see him these two different performances because they are so different um yeah yeah and um yeah so i thought the subject matter of the movie was great i think it j honestly i feel like maybe in the hands of maybe a different director or a different screenwriter. I think this could have been a much, for me, a much better film. Um, I don't, one, I don't particularly like Michael Mann's style. I actually don't know if I'd have to look and see. I don't know if there's any of his. You didn't movies. like heat that much. So I hated yeah. heat actually. Do you, like, do you like Manhunter? No. Oh, collateral. Wow. I haven't seen Collateral. Oh, okay. So I think I just don't really like Michael Mann's style. And right. then, yeah, it, the movie just honestly dragged for me. And it made me wish I was watching a different legal or news thriller, like Spotlight or something that mm -hmm. I think was just better done. Um, yeah. Not to say wise, totally it does feel it. like Spotlight for sure. Like in terms of just like that kind of urgency to get out a story and someone else trying to hide that story and, and the implications yeah. of if that story gets out, who's going to take the blow and fall for it. Yeah. It's very interesting. Uh, Cause Chad had mentioned before you watch it, like um, that it could be like this, this year's JFK in terms of like more conspiracy, but this one, I think it's less a conspiracy. I think it's pretty clear. There's a truth to what's going on. There's no question as to what's going on. It's more about the journalism angle of like getting it out there and, and with withholding information that is truth. Whereas JFK is more of like figuring out if it's truth or not. Um, but still in a similar idea in terms of the, the kind of tone, I guess. Um, yeah. 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 Chad, any, any thoughts on the insider? Yeah. Um, well, another, uh, an underrated, uh, film of, of that type, uh, shattered glass. Check out that one. Yeah. That's a really yeah. great one. Anakin. Um, yeah. Anakin. Um, but <laughs> proving that he's an actually good actor. Um, but, um, 
Yeah, the Insider was okay. Uh, it's one of those where I think Carrie and I were like an hour in, and we were both like, all right, we're an hour and in. Not much has happened yet. Um, so let's... I feel like this is one where it could have easily been a sharp two-hour movie. Um, you know, they, they tackle some stuff, but I still feel like there's like not much there for like two and a half hours um, where I'm like, okay, it, it, it's about like the, you know, the reporter and the guy who has the knowledge. He also kind of reminded me a little bit of a Walter White because um, very into chemistry. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I just, there were certain parts that, you know, I felt like, cause you know, the guy was getting really into paranoia which is also a beautiful mind. That's why you thought of a beautiful mind a lot because a very mm -hmm. paranoid character. Um, and uh, so, yeah, he, he liked those roles, I guess. Um, and so you had a lot of that stuff. You had kind of like, I found this a little bit cheesy uh, where you know, they, they got the death threat note and it was like, we'll kill your entire family or something like that. Um, and I'm like, all right, <laughs> I don't know. It just felt a little little much uh i don't know i guess that probably happened yeah it's true it i mean that's happened. so hard to me. it's like it actually happened so but it still yeah. to me felt like i don't know just like okay it just felt like like a by the numbers type of thing kind of like how cider house rules was a little bit whereas like i don't know i just like didn't really think the story was ultimately that interesting like I thought that like I, I like the paranoia aspect. I was pissed off when, you know, they kept trying to like force him to sign something and then not, you know, come out and say anything and I'm like, you know, why why are people letting these people like pressure these guys so the people like uh Russell Crowe's character so much and and stuff but yeah i just i didn't think like all the new stuff i just i don't think i'm i'm the type of fan i don't like jfk i i didn't like uh i like i like spotlight. i think i think spotlight is and we'll talk about that mm -hmm. someday um i think spotlight is is better made i think it's also shorter like i said i think bit, this yeah. could have been mm -hmm. done uh better in a, in a shorter manner um yeah, like but she even said then, is I, another one yeah i didn't care for she said i don't like spotlight uh that much i don't know if i would make a best picture we'll get there um yeah <laughs> the insider, i don't know i think that the pacing was just off and i didn't really care for the characters all that much even al pacino's character i was just like why does this have to be about him again <laughs> kind of a deal like we'll be I don't know. Go <laughs> um, ahead, Dylan. You probably no, like this a lot more than I do. This is another two v one because I freaking adore it. Um, I think oh. it's 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 honestly <laughs> one of the most riveting like three. This flew by for me, and and it's so interesting because it's like, um, yeah, it might just be like the state of mind watching it because I've never seen a lot of Michael Mann. I have never seen Heat. I've never seen Lazo Mohicans. Any of those. So I've never really like known his style necessarily, but I know it's very much about like, you know, it's, it's very intense and it's very New York driven too, which I love. Or, or I don't even know if it's New York, but like a very almost grime. I don't want to say grimy, but like there's a lot of texture I feel in the movie. Like it's, 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 it's a very lived in tight kind of movie. So it kind of does feel a little heavy at times, but for me, the pacing kind of flew by. And I think it's also cause you know, I've been, my brain has been so consumed by these actors and writers strikes lately. And the idea of a studio kind of like dictating things for its employees and I feel like that's why the Al Pacino side of it is so vital and so crucial because CBS tried to silence this because they were at fear that they would be sued for releasing this interview um, because Russell Crowe broke his, um, what's it we call it? Um, uh, non non disclosure agreement. Yeah, his NDA. Yeah, his NDA. He 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 broke his NDA. Um, but they technically tried him in court, so he could legally break his NDA. But then going on sixty minutes and airing this interview would have done a lot of harm, and that's where all the death threat threats come from because it's legitimately this tobacco company trying to have a stranglehold on Russell Crowe's character and basically dictate his whole mm -hmm. life. Like this man can't freely preach for something he believes in and in fighting for this cause because his daughter has asthma I think having his daughter and this is real life but having his daughter have asthma just brings such a more personal tie to his character and the idea that the tobacco company is trying to suppress him and basically dumbledore is like hey you can't say a word or we're gonna like pretty much kill you like it's almost like a threat and then you have cbs who's basically saying if we air this we're gonna get screwed so you can't air it so it's basically like these two other people being suppressed by the things that they love 
Russell Crowe loves his job and he wants to you know, fight for this cause because that is his life. His livelihood is finding the truth and research. It, he's a researcher. He knows that this is vital information that could change the world. And it kind of did, uh, even though tobacco companies still make billions of dollars. But like it did change the world in terms of looking harder at the drugs we consume and, and what these big companies sell us. And then Pacino trying to fight for freedom of speech and basically being able to air his own show it's his show he's the producer of the show but the company thinks it's too dangerous to air it and i love that element how they're both kind of dealing with the same thing even though they're really not related much at all tv production and tobacco research is not a very common thread but they make it a common thread because they kind of can unite in this one thing in that they want to have their voices heard but the the powers that be are suppressing them same as the actors and writers right now i mean the the writers finally got their money but this idea that someone's suppressing you and this is like it shouldn't be a thing that no one should be have to suppress voices when it comes to this kind of thing. Um, and you know, it's news, it's literally news. So we can't even share news now. And I think that's such an interesting element. And that's why I kind of love this film and why it flies by for me is because you do have two very different perspectives. I mean, Russell Crowe, there's a lot about his family life uh, because his wife is legitimately scared that if he spills the secrets people are going to come after him and, and she's in danger and i think that's a real thing that's why i get a lot of breaking bad vibes from this as well the idea that skylar has to just take the kids and go it's kind of a similar thing here where she's like i, I gotta take the kids and go because you are now putting a danger to this family by speaking your truth when he is doing the right thing so there's that moral kind of dilemma there which i really think is engaging because i think mm -hmm. neither one is right neither one is wrong she shouldn't leave him for it but i get why she does and he shouldn't you know he he shouldn't suppress his information but i get why he does at first and then he ultimately says it and then pacino he doesn't have those family problems it's more of a career thing but you even see how him and his friendship with christopher Plummer, who's like the head news anchor um of 60 minutes you see how their relationship is also kind of fractured because christopher Plummer sides with the network and pacino doesn't and and that kind of adds a riff so i really like how the corporate side of things kind of boils down to the actual human relationships and i just think it's really well stylized i love michael mann's direction here i think he is a very polarizing filmmaker so i get why some people aren't fans some people are but i love uh even the little moments like the driving range all the 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 image of the golf balls all in the driving range all scattered around it when russell crowe looks out into the water all, all those really really intense awesome shots it's, it's just like nowadays i feel like if, if a movie were to be made on the subject matter i feel like they could get really just any director would sign up to do it and do it fine and tell the story whereas here i feel like there's actually an attempt at style to tell the story because you could just tell the story matter of fact but when you bring such a stylized eye to it and try to get into like the character rather than the plot i think it's really interesting and i think michael mann does that so that that's my defense of it but i i really i really love it and, and again it, it it hits certain films hit certain people differently so yeah. this is my uh this is my american beauty where i will be on the hill. Um, yeah i mean i i don't think it's necessarily like like something that you have to defend. I, I think it's really cool that you got a lot out of it. Maybe on a rewatch, I might get more out of it. Mm -hmm. um, maybe JFK might hit me more on, on a, on a rewatch as well, because it is like a lot to take in at once. Oh, yeah. um, but I don't know. I, I also just feel like maybe we do you, but even though it flew by, do you think we need the two and a half hours for it? I mean, for me, I don't know. I, I didn't feel like there were any moments really to cut out is the thing. Yeah. Uh, but I, I mean, a little bit at the end, it, maybe it stalls a little bit at the end, but I still think like, I, I don't know. I, I, I really, like I, right now, first, I don't feel like that's I feel like in the first hour we were like, all right, no, nothing yeah. has happened yet. It does take a while. And so. I think that's also an interesting device in, in my perspective of the whole idea of them not revealing right away what the actual secret is. It spends a lot of time with Crow being like, I have, I know something, but I'm not allowed to say it. And Pacino's like, well, if I ask you this question, will you answer it? And he goes, maybe I'll answer it. Like there's a lot of that cat and mouse mm -hmm. for the first hour. And then once he finally uh -huh. has the interview and you find out, who like what actually is happening with the tobacco companies and why this is a big deal i've heard someone say it's like wait really that's the thing they're getting all like hyped up about i'm like yeah it's it's awful they're they're putting random drugs in these cigarettes you know like that that to me is is really rough but i think some people expect maybe a bigger bomb drop i don't know but um i think i, I, do, like, I think that first hour is a little bit of a build up to that for yeah. sure but but i i think it's kind of needed if you're intrigued in what the actual mystery is i think it does a good job kind of leaving you wanting to know what what's going on it could have been maybe sped up a little bit i agree yeah. i think like ultimately like just a, your point about people go like that's what the thing is about like um i think kind of like the thing that i was thinking a little bit it was like 
Oh, nicotine is addictive. Yeah, we know. We we knew that already. Okay, but it's like, well, maybe back then we didn't. But um, right. another well, it's thing, not even the nicotine. It's it's the other stuff they're putting because it's like right. another drug they're putting in that they're not telling. Yeah, that's the that's the kicker. But. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to add was uh, Carrie and I were very surprised, and Dylan hasn't gotten there yet. But uh, there's a Buffy uh, actress that's in oh. this. It's Lindsay Krause, and she plays Maggie oh, yeah. in season four. I won't uh, elaborate because I want Dylan to watch Buffy. Mm. Um, but um, Lindsay Krause is interesting that she's in this because um, she was also in All the President's Men that's very similar to um, this movie. Which I've never seen either, um, so we, we will talk about it. You're going to freaking love it probably <laughs> if you... <laughs> You love this one. You probably really love it. <laughs> Which means you uh, probably won't. <laughs> no, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I, I like it. We'll see. It might grow on. That one also might grow on me. Um, but also uh, Dylan might like this actress because she uh, she's apparently a Broadway actress. Oh, um, who, who is Lindsay, it again? Lindsay Krause. Um, Lindsay Krause. You talk a little bit more. I'm going to look this up. And it was weird seeing her with long hair because she doesn't have long hair in Buffy. Oh, she's um, she's Pacino's wife. Okay. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the whole movie. She was uh, Pacino's wife. Oh, I thought I thought Dylan met in real life. She's out. Oh no 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 no, no, no. sorry sorry. <laughs> um, oh. oh, and then the other thing that when Dylan was talking about the insider, and she was lives like, in my neighborhood. By the way, I should go hit her. Uh, up. Go say to hang up. out to hang out. You, now and then and then well, maybe maybe you'll know two Buffy actors. I know right? Dylan's just gonna meet all the Buffy. I'm just gonna be friends with all the Buffy actors. Maybe I'll ask uh, uh, my my buddy Larry uh, for for Thora Birch's contact so I can be friends friends with uh, all the Hocus yes! Pocus too. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> I want to meet all those people. Um, but I was gonna say like as Dylan was lauding the this film that he loves, um, he did he was talking about the cat and mouse stuff of it, and I was like, this dude's gonna. He's gonna love heat. I can't I'll tell yeah, you that. <laughs> I think I just really like his style. And and honestly, I it's funny because I saw my first man film a week before I saw this uh, at the film festival. I saw Ferrari and mm. I didn't love it as much as I liked yeah. this. Um so I was I was honestly my my expectations were a little lower. Um, but now that I kind of like have seen two of them, I kind of want to watch the rest to see. So maybe I, a, a ranking day someday, Jeff. Well, yeah, we definitely should do a man ranking. I'm trying to find uh, my CD. I have a Larry Bagby original copies oh uh, that's so cool i don't know where it is but i'll find it i was i was gonna say um for man specifically i think my favorite one of his is actually collateral but i did go through a huge uh tom cruise phase you're I'm still, argue, i hate I'm to blame you friend you're in. still in it yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i can tell you that very clearly um yeah no that's great uh yeah you pick you picked him for both top gun and for uh for fourth of boiling the fourth of july so you're you're in that phase but it's a good phase, it's a good phase. I, I i'm still in a pacino phase i'll be in a pacino phase when he's retired and when i'm retired um <laughs> Ooh -ah. I love pacino. Ooh -ah. um all right so the insider any any other thoughts on the insider any inside scoops no okay <laughs> yeah um the insider uh nominated for seven but also like the green mile doesn't win any uh it's nominated for best picture best director for michael mann with two ends actor russell crowe best adapted screenplay sound cinematography and film editing uh seven nominations if, if it were one short it would be six um and that's the only connection i can make to the sixth sense but um <laughs> let's talk about <laughs> the sixth <laughs> sense i i, I could have been a more elaborate been like i saw this movie i tasted this movie i heard this movie i touched what? this movie i smelled this movie if only i had a sixth sense that's my other segue chat take it away you do you see web people um <laughs> I do. Sixth sense. directed by m night Shyamalan. <laughs> written yeah. by m night Shyamalan. cinematography by tak fujimoto Music by James Newton Howard, starring Bruce Willis, I mean Willis, Haley Joel Osment, Tony Collette, Olivia Williams, Donnie Wahlberg, Glenn Fitzgerald, Misha Barton, and M. Night Shyamalan. Synopsis, the patient of a children's psychologist claims he can see dead people. We've made it, we're here, we, uh, we got yeah. the movie that this we did this year for this month. <laughs> Do we all love it? Let's find out. Um... Yeah, who wants to start? I, I I started. Didn't I start with the insider? Oh no, I didn't. I, I did. Okay, so Gary, you're the guest. Start again with the sixth sense. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so the sixth Is this sense. First, first watch for everyone. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, when Chad asked me when I, if I wanted to be on picture this and kind of what year I might want to do, um, this was kind of one of the few we were kicking around. Um. Because specifically, I love this movie so much. Um, 
Uh, I don't know. I watched it. it. It actually wasn't the first horror movie I ever saw. I actually saw Friday the 13th when I was like six and it didn't scare me for some reason. Um, this movie, though, I saw when I was 10 and it gave me uh, a recurring nightmare for like a straight year. And then I still had that recurring nightmare occasionally, I would say, up until like. What was it? Do you know? Do you remember? Oh, it would be like seeing dead people in my house, in my childhood home. Hanging. Uh, just, just walking. like walking around, just walking. Yeah. They, look like, they, they look like normal people. They don't know they're dead. You know, uh, I know you two. I don't know. You know the, when the hairs prickle? That's that. Yeah, no, I, I took that literally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you're holding it. I was a kid. Uh, so it, it scared the crap out of me. I had that recurring nightmare occasionally, I would say up until like. 10 years ago or so um like a solid solid 10 years of recurring nightmares with this movie um i think it's the reason that like supernatural type horror scares me the most uh uh and a fun fact about this movie is when i watched it um i was telling chad this uh I watched it when I was 10 and I was very sheltered. Um, so I thought that when you got shot, you died. Like I thought that was it. You got shot and you died. That's what happens. <laughs> so I had the so- same thought with uh, with Spider-Man with, with Uncle Ben. I, I had always thought, I was like, that's a, that's a death sentence, which yeah. sometimes it could be, but yeah. With Uncle Ben, it was. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but any so Bruce Willis, you know, gets shot and then he shows up in the next scene. And I say to my parents, I'm like, didn't he just die? And they're like, <laughs> uh, Oh, you called it? Before. Oh my god, that's amazing. But I didn't call it because I like had some special like you know inside. I called it because I just thought if you got shot that you died. And <laughs> right. So did you like think in that moment then like, oh, so he did survive, so people can survive this, and you learned, or were you the whole time like, oh, so he is dead? No, I was like, oh, I guess he must have survived it. Oh, okay, and my, okay. my parents just didn't say anything. Right. Okay. Like, they, oh, that's better. Yeah. They didn't say it. They weren't like, you know, oh, you, you got it or whatever. They they kind of threw up their hands and thought I had guessed it. But yeah. So the movie I, did still fool you after all. It, it did definitely fool me. Um, I, so I'll say I still love this movie. I think it still holds up extremely well. It's still... You know, actually, I'll say it's lost a little bit of its scare element to me um, at this yeah. point. Although I still think that beginning scene with Donnie Wahlberg is still so terrifying. Um, Unrecognizable, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the end scene with Cole and his mom where they're sitting in the car, mm-hmm. that scene just, it gets me every single time. I love that scene. I think that's kind of like the biggest heart of this movie is that relationship between Cole and his mom. Um, So I I don't know what else to say about that. I love this movie. Uh, (laughs) I've talked long enough. (laughs) That's okay. Chad, what are your your thoughts? Carrie even said uh, at the end, when we got to that scene with them in the car, she was like, I wish it would just end here. And um, I actually might agree i'd have to rewatch to like look at the structure of the film and and find out if i actually think so but i'm sitting there like you know what maybe we do find out spoiler um that you know bruce willis was a ghost the entire time um and then we end with the sweet moment in the car i think that could have been a better ending yeah um well and that's another thing kind of what we talk about american beauty it's all about perspective and like we're seeing the movie from bruce willis's perspective maybe it would have been a little more interesting if we saw it from kind of Haley Joel Osment's, which I guess we do for a lot of it, but you know, it's, it's his story. So I feel like that's why they had to end it that way. But I agree with you. Like, I think yeah. that is the scene. Um, and I think by the time Bruce Willis realizes it, at least I'll talk about my experience with the twist itself, but like you kind of know by the time he realizes it, that he is right. Or is that kind of where everyone was like, Oh shit, he's a, he's dead. Cause I feel like I kind of picked up on it. Or at least I it's, feel like others may have picked up on it a little earlier. I think it's the twist at the very end that generally when they, you know, because they, because M. Night kind of like telegraphs this and like goes back and like recontextualizes things and just goes, mm-hmm. you know, and then you go, oh, wait, all the little things. I'll say gotcha. for me on my first watch, like 
yeah, I didn't realize it till it was like okay. me neither. Yeah. Blade, so I think Blade. so I think it's interesting because I think if you don't know the twist and you're you don't know, I think that is a good ending scene because that's the twist. But I think yeah. it, once you've seen it again, there should be a you know the twist cut where it's like that scene comes earlier and then you end with the coal scene. Because I think really that is the best scene, the coal scene. That is a great that would be a great yeah. ending. But I get why he wanted to end on that twist then, because that's when you kind of you know share mm -hmm. the big, big twist. Um yeah, for, and this is where I'm, 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 I was alluding to earlier. I knew the twist when I first watched this movie. So I think that is where I'm a little, my first experience, and I'll say right now, I hated this movie the first time I watched it because I was watching it. I was like, I know he's dead. Like, it's like, there was no suspense to me. I was like, like I, he's sitting at this table with this woman at dinner. Like, it's obvious she doesn't recognize him because he's dead. Like the whole time I was like, and it was like the cars thing where when you're watching cars, you're trying to figure out, wait, who built the cars? Did cars build the cars? But then who built them? And, and it's like the chicken or the egg. Like, how do cars reproduce? Um, they, that kind of thing where, like, everyone has written essays and essays about cars. That's how I felt about The Sixth Sense the first time I watched it. I just spent the whole time just trying to overanalyze everything. Well, if he's dead, then why is this a whole year later? He hasn't recognized, in a, he hasn't picked up on the fact that he's dead for a whole year. And then it's like the whole, like, no, you see what you want to see thing. But then I'm like, yeah. But then I was like, that's such a cop out then. Because then it's just like, what? But then oh, I'm getting to the good part. When I rewatched it this time, I could finally be like, you know what? I'm going to give it a fresh lens because I know you two love it. And I and I, I would hate to come on the show. this horror themed. You know, this is the movie Carrie wanted to do for the show and trash on it. So I was really hoping I would love it. I was really, really hoping. And I did. I fucking loved it because I think when I could separate the idea of overanalyzing the twistiness of it and every frame being like, but he's dead here, but he's dead here. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. When I could focus it on Cole. And this is, I think what we're all kind of talking about. The Cole story is so fascinating. And the idea that the things that scare us, maybe they're scared too. And maybe they're just trying to communicate and we couldn't, you know, assuming ghosts are real, which I think they are. Um, but like, you know, the idea that like, you know, maybe, maybe they just want to have that closure and that's what, Cole mm. is giving them and, and that beautiful scene I mean uh it, it's it's sad obviously because we see that she's been poisoned but that little girl you know when he finally does that act of goodness and and uses his powers for good rather than fearing them and, and feeling like he is he doesn't belong because of them like I was really into it and I, and I I even loved the Bruce Willis stuff with his wife at the end too and he's like finally accepting that he's ready to go I just loved it so much more this time and I think it's because the first time I was so hung up on the twist whereas I I like the movie when you can either not know the twist and be surprised or when you can finally just kind of put the twist aside and focus on the movie for what it is, which is just a really good ghost story and a really unique ghost story, a really different one. It's not your ghost ghost where it's like a romance, but it's also not like a scary ghost movie in the fact that like the ghosts are evil necessarily either. It's like this really interesting nuanced take on it. So uh, I've really come around on this film and I'm so glad I have um, because, you know, uh, cars I haven't yet, uh, but this I definitely <laughs> have. So um, yeah, I'm very excited that we're, that we're talking about this finally. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I was actually literally just about to say, um, I, this, maybe this could have, cause Dylan and I both love this movie. Um, uh, maybe this could have ended up having a ghost ending the, the movie ghost, um, mm -hmm. where Bruce Willis is going to go into heaven and he's finally going to heaven and they get to see each other and, uh, and stuff. And it's beautiful. I remember, I, I love that ghost. Ending. It's very cheesy, but I love it. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I, I'm glad they didn't put that in there. Yeah. Chad, um, did you know the twist going in the first time you watched it or no? Um, I don't think I did. I My whole thing with this is I remember my dad uh, trying to be hilarious, I think, was like, you know, like, you want to watch The Sixth Sense with me? Kind of a deal like, you know, I, I know he's he's really young he doesn't really care about horror movies, um, you know, but this is a, it was big as people yeah. like really. And, he, and it's one of those movies where you want to watch someone else watch it for the first time because you want to see their reaction to things. Exactly. Um, but I mean, I don't even know if I was like in the right age or mindset to really understand any of us probably like around Carrie where it's like, don't you die if you get shot, you know, kind of a deal. Um, but yeah, I don't think I knew, but then it in pop culture became like the movie, like, you know, of it's that twist. And then, you know, Robot Chicken's like making fun of him. Night Shyamalan, like, what they twist, you know, kind of a deal. Yeah. And then, um, you know, everyone, like, even in Scrubs, there's a whole bit where the janitor has never seen the sixth sense. He spoils a, a football game 
for Dr. Cox. And then Dr. Cox is like, Bruce Willis is dead at the end of the movie. And he's like, no, you know, remember that? That was a great bit. Um, but um, it's interesting because um, uh, I has have been turned on to the uh, podcast uh, Critically Acclaimed. And um, every time I, I, will, I will listen to this, a lot of the times Whitney Seibold will talk about um, – uh, twists and how he doesn't care if people spoil things for him because he's like, I want to just watch great movies. And if a movie is spoiled just entirely because you know the twist, then it's not a good movie. If it, if the only thing you're watching for is the twist. Although I will say that it is exciting when you do discover something in a movie right. and you don't have it spoiled. So I'll say like The Sixth Sense, I think is a good movie despite uh, that, however, watching this, I will say I, I have some, like a slight negative um, for The Sixth Sense. I don't think it's a perfect movie. And it's interesting because I was watching it this time and I was like, the the marketing for the movie is people were like, you know, M. Night Shyamalan is the next Spielberg. Like that was on a magazine. Yeah. And I was watching this and I was like, honestly, looking at this movie, how it's kind of filmed and constructed in some ways. And then like, going to see M. Night Shyamalan now, I'm like, I think he's still kind of in a, in a very amateurish way of filmmaking. Like, I don't even see him being even close to a Spielberg, like his, mm. like, perfect filmmaking kind of a deal. Right. Well, because Spielberg is so f about formalism and, and, and yeah. Shyamalan's the opposite. He's trying to just break form as much as he can, at least in terms of storytelling. But the style is a little, I mean, in terms of this movie at least is a little similar, but so even like the, the way it was shot and stuff, I was like, mm, this feels a little like amateurish as far as like being like a best picture and stuff like that. Although, you know, there, there are a lot of great movies that, you know, I don't know. I don't know what I'm getting into. Like, this isn't a whole thing, but I do love this movie. I think it is still a great movie. Um, but I was just interested in watching it. And I was like, you know, I don't know if M night Shyamalan's ever like grown, in like any significant way um you know so i feel like this is kind of part of the thing where you, you might be early. you might be divisive on uh the sixth sense you know, in, in some ways if you look at it now and you for don't sure. have any nostalgia for it or if you're like dylan like maybe you grow on it grows on you or something like that yeah. but i do think it's a very sweet movie i think horror is where Tony Collette belongs because you know I love her in Hereditary. Mothers so, in horror, especially. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I think she's an, an incredible. Um, you know, uh, did she act, did she get a nomination? She did, and she didn't for Hereditary. And I think that's a much better performance, even though she is good. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. But yeah, Hereditary is like one of the all yeah. time timers um, right. kind of deal. But um, but yeah, I love the whole all the stuff with Cole the relationship with Bruce and like watching it now that I just know the twist. Um, I I'm sitting there and I'm like, it's so obvious. Like I just don't, <laughs> right? I don't even see how you could think that he would just show up at a dinner and she just wouldn't talk to him the whole time. Like right. that was my issue. The first time I watched it, I was so fixated on those things. Yeah. I, it, it was mostly the, also the year jump. If it was like a month or two jump, I would get it. But the fact that it was a whole year, I was like, he spent the whole year walking around town thinking he was, your that's guy? what i said and then yeah. carrie was like but he's they no, see what they want to he kind of just yeah. showed up there like now and he's seeing what he wants to see kind of do, right, right. right. Like yeah i my interpretation of it is that he you know you he doesn't you know just pop out as a ghost he's got to like simmer for a year and then he kind of like hmm. you know yeah. it's like the, the vampire coming out of the coffin he's been sleeping for, for yeah like, hibernation yeah. type thing yeah yeah but I was looking in for stuff like that. Like Harry knows I was sitting there like, you know, wait a second. Okay. So Cole walks in into seeing <laughs> his mother with Bruce Willis. So like, what did, does he know what therapy is? Do, how does he just assume that they were talking before he came in the room? And I don't know. You can definitely overanalyze this thing, mm -hmm. but yeah. I think it is a lot better if you don't, because it's, it's art. It's right. You know, they're, the message, I think, does defend it. I do love uh, some of the great moments, like, you know, the moment in the car between them talking about um, her mother. Yeah. Uh, but then also, like, the sweet moment uh, you guys talked about, like, Misha Barton's death and, like, that kind of arc where she gets... That's Misha Barton? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Oh Little baby Misha Barton. Yeah. Uh, Marissa um, Cooper. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, uh, she, uh, 
when when they they find that out and then you know the guy uh you know was hating that for his wife um uh, after that of course that's like that's so troubling just to think about even at, like, as a parent now too i'm just like oh my god god that's and but then you get the sweet scene between um i believe it's cole and the little sister and she's yeah. like am i gonna ever see her again probably not kind of a deal but um it's like oh shit this is this is dark and deep and sad um but yeah i love the stuff between um uh cole and bruce uh, the, the only thing too carrie hit on this as well is i do think it kind of does lose its scare factor a little bit when you watch a lot of horror because when I'm seeing the things like some of the things like the re hand reaching out from under the bed, when she first shows up, like you, you dribble in the, the poison or whatever. Um, and then the camera pans down on her. That's kind of scary. And then kind of like the little boy with the shot on the back of the head and then the Donnie Wahlberg thing. But a lot of the rest, they all just kind of like the woman in the kitchen. I was like, that's not, that's not scary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so weird. It does. You know? I was like, oh, this is kind of corny. Yeah. But they used to, I cannot tell you how much they used to scare me. <laughs> yeah. What? Well, did you, yeah. So go ahead. I was just going to say, like, I, I, because when you said like horror six cents, I was like, is it really a horror? But I didn't want to say that because I was like, I haven't seen it in so long. Maybe it's a horror it is. drama. Um, but yeah, it, I, I think it is more like a drama with this more like an ominous tint you know rather than like a horror film um i mean maybe it is a horror film for obviously uh, it, it was for carrie at a point but like <laughs> but, but the idea where it, it is much more yeah like a character drama with like horror tints to it rather than like a full-fledged at least as we know it horror film you know mm -hmm. like it's not meant to scare us first and foremost it's supposed to especially with the message of the ghost not all being scary and evil but just needing to be understood i think rewatching it it's less of a horror because of that element but i i do think it's more it's the horror is not the priority but it but it is good i know exactly what you're saying and i i agree with you on on some counts but then my my slight disagreement is because, well, I have like a very wide uh, definition of horror, but also because like I feel like this is the type of and I know you're not doing this, Dylan, you're not doing no, it, but a lot of people do try to use that argument to say why horror doesn't get nominated. And they go, well, the Sixth Sense isn't a horror. The Silence of the Lambs isn't a horror. And then they they try to frame it as like, well, good movies get nominated and those are good because they're not horror kind of a deal but i i say like you know it, it i think it definitely fits in horror even though i do totally agree and understand with what you're saying about you can make an argument that a drama first with an horror tint to it um we just what did we just watch carrie that was a uh, drama with a horror god oh man it was something recent that i was like shit this is kind of like a drama with a horror tent but I mean, there are a lot of is it oppenheimer you're talking about no, but that's that's another one. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of like those movies though too, where it's like, in my in my what I meant was like it's not an overt horror film the way like a paranormal activity is where like jump scares galore, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's like it's 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 you know because there's a lot of dramas that I think are hard. Like Amor is the scariest movie I've ever watched. I'll still stand by that. Oh yeah, uh, you know Oppenheimer might win Best Picture, and its biggest competition is a Frankenstein story. Poor things. So it's like there's still a lot of like yeah. interesting layers of horror in the drama we watch too, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. But I get what you're saying. Like something shouldn't be dismissed if it is more dramatic than it is scary. As like, oh well, that's why I got nominated because it's not really horror; it's more drama. Like, no, this is still a horror film, but it's not as scary as it once was. Is is yeah. you know, but it still has scary elements to it. I mean, it, it is scary. Uh, this you know, this poor kid, <laughs> you know, it, yeah, it's, it's I, creepy in that way. There's definitely a lot of, like I think the scene in the kitchen is a good example with like the woman. She just like turns around. She's got yeah. her, you know. Yeah. It's kind and, of like that. And it's you not get scare, but it's right. it's pretty jarring but even like before that you kind of get like the same vibe as like a horror because like cole for cole it is a horror movie <laughs> his life is a horror movie uh at first until right. he can kind of recontextualize yeah. it go okay maybe i can face these things that you know i'm scared of um but yeah at first like and i did this all the time and like if it's very dark i would like run to the bathroom like something's gonna get me and that's what he does. And I'm like, I relate to that, Cole. I get it, bro. <laughs> yeah, but the difference is he actually sees things, he does, which is yeah. even scarier. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a horror film. It is. But it's, you know, might not be as scary as it was, but it's still a horror film. Yeah, so I agree yeah. with that. Um, but I also, yeah, go ahead. 
I was just gonna say, I also love like, you know, the fact that he's, um, you know, uh, he, there's a lot of stuff about like his dad left and, you know, he has the glasses, he's wearing the glasses because he found them and, you know, they're his, his dad's and, but the, the lenses hurt his eyes and, but he learns like to kind of like connect more to his mother at, at, towards the end and, um, you know, and stuff. And he's very bullied. And I, I do think stuttering Stanley, stuttering Stanley. I do think that's a very scary, scary scene too. Yeah. Scene. Yeah. yeah. It, oh, yeah. It's, not, it's not ghosts, but it's, you know, it's kind of ghosts. Yeah. When you said critically claimed, uh, I, I thought you were going to comment on the fact that Whitney Seibold <laughs> refuses to pronounce his last name, right? He always calls it Shamalan. Uh, and maybe that is how you pronounce it. M. Night Shamalan. I don't know. Uh, every time he brings up M. Night Shyamalan's name, he says M. Night Shyamalan. I don't know. That's just a funny little little tidbit. I don't know if you've ever picked up on that. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Yeah. Uh, listen to, uh, did, did they just, What I don't remember the last one they just did, but he brings up, uh, they, they talk about signs and, and he talks about, he's like, oh, M. Night Shyamalan's signs. I'm like, why do you say Shyamalan? I don't know. Whitney, if you're listening, let us know. Shyamalan, why, why, why are you saying it like that? But, I've heard. Um, oh, and the other thing I was going to say about that, uh, you said the Steven Spielberg comparison. It's interesting how they immediately went Steven Spielberg, not because of style or anything, but more so, this is Shyamalan's like, first film, right? No, no. He did, uh, I think, two, maybe one, uh, uh, definitely one, but at least one, maybe two before uh, but this was like his kind of breakout. Okay. So a lot of people think it's his debut. So, th so that, that totally negates my whole argument. Cause my whole argument was going to be like <laughs> Spielberg started with duel and Sugarland express before he got to jaws. Whereas this one, it's like, this is his first, but, but it sounds like Shaman started with two things before he got to this too. So it's mm -hmm. a similar career trajectory in that way, I guess. Yeah. That, like it was like Spielberg made two really good films and then made jaws a masterpiece. Whereas like Shaman probably made two good films. And then I don't know if his other films are good because I haven't seen those two, uh, but um, yeah, very we interesting. We won't talk about signs, but I think, um, and, and some people might say signs is, is even better. Yeah. My um, favorite is still unbreakable. I, I think that's my favorite of his, but uh, this is definitely there. up there. And I really do. I, I'm so glad we watched it for this because I really was uh, kind of a, not a hater, but I was very much like, that's so overrated. Like you, you, it's kind of the, what Chad said about like, you can see, totally tell that he's dead. <laughs> like, but, but it was my, I also watched that in high school. So it was like that high school brain of like, I'm too smart for this movie. Whereas now I'm like actually owning up to the fact that I'm an adult who has flaws and can actually enjoy something for how it is. And I enjoy it. I think it's amazing. Yeah. Chad. And, and just like seeing that the acting is incredible in the movie and there's a reason I see dead people is one of the most iconic scenes of yeah. all time. Like in just in movie moments, mm -hmm. that's like top 100 easily. Yeah. And, and when I first watched this film, I thought that was where the twist was going to come. And I was like, wait, it's happening now. This, we're only halfway through. And I thought that's where he tells him that he is dead, but he doesn't. He says he sees dead people. And he's like, that's not weird, right? You don't think lesser of me, all this stuff to kind of subvert the audience's expectations again, to make it more centered on Cole and not leave the audience to think, oh, wait, is he trying to send this guy a message? Because he's not. He's just trying to. It, it, well, I also it. kind of forgot in the beginning. And I was like, wait, does Cole know that he's dead? And then Carrie was like, no. And then I was like, are you sure? Because like, he's like, you know, I hope I see you again kind of a thing. And then, you know, I was reading too much into it because later I was like, oh, yeah, he he totally doesn't right. know. Well, and he's also always wearing a jacket so you can't see the wound. Whereas like the yeah. other the other characters, it's like you can see the, the bullet through the face, you know. And another and uh, a fun fun thing is we realized that um, the lady who plays his wife is Rosemary Cross and uh, Rushmore. Yeah. Yeah. Olivia Williams. Uh, she was, uh, I think it's only the second time movie we talked about with her. She's also the nurse in uh, the father uh, that with Anthony Hopkins that we watched. She's Whoa. also Mrs. Darling and my favorite version of Peter Pan from 2003. Uh, I love Olivia Williams. Um, so I was very excited to see her pop up in this. I, for some reason, I thought her role was a little bit bigger. Like, I feel like there were a few more moments with him and his wife in the movie, but yeah. when watching it, I'm like, she's really not in it a ton, but she, when she's in it, she's great. I mean, my heart breaks for her, but yeah. Um, any other thoughts on Sixth Sense? Classic. Cool. Yeah. Classic. And, and oddly enough, guess how many nominations the Sixth Sense got? None. No, it got six. six. Oh, Chad, it was nominated for best picture. Of course, it got it at least. Yeah, one. Right. <laughs> no, but it was uh, six. six. Uh, look at that, six. Uh, picture director for M Night Shyamalan. Uh, sorry, Shyamalan. Uh, supporting actor for Haley Joel Osment. Supporting actress for Tony Collette. Original screenplay and film editing. Wait, is that? Dude, six. Six. You, I I thought you were because the way you phrased it, 
you were going with the six thing. I didn't know. I was like, is this going to be the big twist? God, see. Oh, that would have been a funny buildup if I was like, guess how many nominations it got? No, it just got five. Like, that would have been funny. But it actually got six, so there's no way to subvert uh, expectations there. But now it's time to rank these puppies um, and from fifth to first, worst to best, uh, or least best to best, if you like all of them. Um, so, Carrie, you're our guest. I'll let you start with your – I don't have nothing to write with, so I'll type it uh, – with your number five. Oh, okay. Um my number five is the cider house rules all right uh chad my number five is the insider all right my number five is american beauty so carrie what is your number four my number four is the insider all right chad your number four the cider house rules my number four is also the cider house rules so carrie your number apparently. your number three um uh, my number three is american beauty all right chad your number three Surprisingly, my number three is the sixth sense. My number three is also the sixth sense. So, Carrie, what is your number two? My number two is the sixth sense. Interesting. Wow. Uh, Chad. My number two, and I'm excited because Carrie and I share something, is American Beauty. My number two is one that none of us have said yet is the Green Mile, which means, Carrie, your number one is? The Green Mile. Chad, your number one is? The Green Mile. And my number one's The Insider, but it doesn't matter because The Green Mile is our collective, because it's my number two and your number one's, our collective number one. Yeah. I was interested. I For some reason, I just expected because we were doing the show because of The Sixth Sense. I was like, well, the two of them are going to put it at number one. Yeah. And, but but hey, we got a Stephen King movie as our number one on October, yeah. which also feels apropos. There's some spooky shit going on in that movie too, so I'm, I'm happy with it. The thing about it is like... Uh, it's weird because I kind of went in this like thinking maybe the sixth sense might be number one. I also know I really, really like American beauty and I, I couldn't remember if I loved the green mile as much because I just hadn't seen it in a long time. And then my top two blew me away. And then the third one, I was like, yep, classic. Mm -hmm. And so. Chad, I will say uh, we've done it twice before. Promising Young Woman was your number one, my my number eight. West Side Story was my number one, your number five. And we have done it again. My number one, The Insider, is your number five. So we've done it three times now where wow. one of our number ones is our number five. Uh, but, but Carrie didn't have it at five. So it, it, it was in the Queen's Amer I, 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 after watching American Beauty, because I watched that before The Green Mile, I was like, I'm probably going to put American Beauty number one. I'd really love that movie. And that would have been the first time ever that we had the same one in five swapped, which, and I never, almost, which still has never happened. Never happened. I almost did, especially when we were like you know, debating in the first uh, movie. I was like, fucking putting a number one now. But I was like, <laughs> We discussed the Green Mile, and I was like, "No, you your ranking just a I love the Green Mile. Yeah, I'm just gonna <laughs> fight rank. It's like, no, no, I was like, um, you know, the Green Mile has to be my nice. number one. Nice. So we're gonna transition now to our acting prizes. We're gonna start with actress today because Carrie, as a guest, we always elect the guest to pick if they want to go actor or actress first, which means they will go last for the other one. We'll just reverse. I know where. Um, but I, I kind of might have an idea too, but I don't know for sure. Uh, but Carrie, you're gonna go first for actress today. Who is gonna be your best? actress of these five movies it's gonna be tony collette Damn, nope. that was mine as well <laughs> tell us about what um it yeah i i think in particular like we talked about that scene in the car um just i i don't know just the emotion on her face and the way she conveys it when cole is or Haley joel osmond is talking to her about um you know, her mom and, you know, her mom watching her dance and what she said at her grave. And it's like, oh my gosh, it gets me every time. Yeah. And I, I do honestly, the, another scene I really love Tony Collette in is the scene where, um, she's bringing Cole home from the hospital and she's laying him down and she sees his bruises. And like, as a parent now that scene hits so, so much harder for me. And just like, you know, I don't know, like Tony Collette has just this way of emoting, I think that is so expressive and just, I think, conveys, um, I guess in this and in Hereditary, like the feelings of a parent, you know, in grief um, yeah. or dealing with, you know, something bad happening to their child. Um, she She's just absolutely fantastic. And I do, I think she 
in particular uh, is one of the things that elevates this movie. Um, I think it does definitely have its flaws. And I think if not for her performance, I wonder if this would have been a best picture nominee, if it would have been, you know, kind of as widely watched and acclaimed as it is, if it would have just been known. I mean, I know it's pretty much just known for its twist, but I think, you know, if you, as if, Going into it knowing the twist, I think her performance is kind of what stands out, actually. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I didn't write down uh, Tony Collette because I knew I wasn't going to get her. <laughs> yeah. guys, uh, especially because I knew Carrie was going to take her. Right. Not that right. it would fall to Dylan or anything like right. that. Um, but also I remembered um, Her Hereditary. That's the one that I'm like, that should have been nominated for Best Picture because that's a great movie that is basically a family drama that just happens to the 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 themes of the movie just happen to fall into very horrific territory. Yeah. Um, so I'm up next, and and it's tough because I'll be honest, I think the actor slate is just a little heavier than the the uh, oh, yeah. actor yeah. slate, yeah. just because there are also a lot of male leads in these movies. Um, but I'm gonna also go with someone from the same film. I'm gonna go Olivia Williams for the Sixth Sense uh, because I really. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't care for some of the performances in some of the other films. And I think her presence is so important because you need to also care about their relationship to become invested in the fact that he does have that emotional moment at the end. And while we all agree that the Tony Collette scene is stronger, I think his scene with her at the end does still need to leave the audience in an emotional place. And I think it does because of her acting as well throughout the film and, and, and playing that lonely loneliness and quietness. She's not in a lot of the film, but you know, we're not picking, you know, actors versus supporting. We could pick any actress. So um, I, I think it's really good. Um, and I, I think her moments, especially in the beginning of the film too, like you, you need to feel the loss as well. And, and I think she really, you know, you, you see why they love each other and why they're so happy. So when stuff happens later on the film and in that moment, when he gets shot, you feel something, uh, which is important. I, I, I think Tony Collette was the obvious one, one here if we were talking draft day terms, like I, it would have been my pick as well. So, uh, but I, I also came so around on this film that I'm so happy and I wanted to give it something. And I, I, I we'll, we'll talk about actor later, but I, I really just love her in this film as well. I, th I think it's got a great cast. So I'm going to give, give my love to her, Olivia Williams. And cause I'm such a fan of hers um, as you know, Chad, Chad brought her up at the last minute. I was like, wait, 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 I'm going to talk about her in a sec. Um, but yeah, no, like I, I love her in Peter Pan. I love her in Rushmore. I love her in the father. Um, so I, I'm, I'm glad we're representing her. Cause I don't think she's in a lot of other best picture movies. I'm not sure. I'll look it up, but uh, Rushmore Chad, yes. Uh, Chad, we'll segue to you. Uh, but if you have anything to say on, on Olivia Williams, either of you. She's great. I love her and Rushmore especially. Um, but yeah, she's, she's great in the, Six cents as well. Um, I'm between. I was. I oh, she was, was in an, an education too. So we have talked about another. Oh, one. that's right. Okay. And that's the right. postman, which I think we'll talk about. I don't okay. know. Um, I'm. I I was between two people from the same film, and I've decided. Um, I'm gonna go. I, I was gonna go Thor Birch. I'm gonna go Mina Savari. Oh. Um, okay. I, I th I just think like her whole story thing is incredible. I love how she at first is just very, um, you know, uh, just like confident and stuff. And like, you know, I've, I've done everything, you know, I'm so experienced. I'm so cool kind of a thing. And then later, you know, she gets told like, you're kind of ordinary and boring and not cool. And, you know, you're just Thor is cool or something, something like that kind of a deal. Um, but then, you know, when she does have that very vulnerable moment and opens up and just realizes that, you know, she, she's not, she's, she's a poser in a lot of ways and stuff. And it's, it's probably better to be real and true to yourself than to try and be something you're not and, and something. And I think that kind of goes into a lot of the themes of the movies for other characters as well. Um, is to be true to yourself and, and things like that. So yeah, I, I don't know. And she doesn't she doesn't have like a a very big career, and no. I, I just think this is like the one great movie, in my opinion, great movie that I think she was really great in. So yeah. um, I was gonna say after this in American Beauty or that this is American Beauty, American Pie. I don't think she she's done a little bit of American Horror hmm. Story. It looks like. Oh, okay, cool. But that's it, really, from, like, notable stuff. Six Feet Under, she had a recurring role on. So, yeah. 
Interesting. Um, yeah, no, great, great performance. As I said, I, I think the performances in that movie are, are solid, even if I don't yeah. love the movie itself. I thought you were going to go in that Benning, uh, but you know, yeah. I thought about it. I thought about it, but then I was like, mm. she's she's good. I I can't wait to see her in uh, what's the movie? A Nyad. Nyad. Yeah. Uh, All right. Yeah, uh, might be a winner there. <laughs> what I've heard. Yeah, but you you get to come back around now for for actor Chad. So what would you like for your best actor? Uh, this one, okay. I was okay. I was I I had one that I was definitely gonna go with, and then I saw a, a certain movie, and then I was like, nope, I gotta go with this one instead. Uh, it's there's no contest. Um, but if no one chooses the actor that I was gonna pick, then I'll bring them back around at the end and go. That's who I would have picked if this other one didn't uh, wow me. I'm picking Michael Clark Dunk Duncan. Uh, there's no contest here in my opinion. Like I said, like I was lauding when, when we were talking about this movie, just, he's just one of the great characters in film. It's a Paddington, but like the performance dude, like this guy, like when he's like, you know, I've never seen one of the picture films or pictures or whatever. Uh, I forget how he says it, but he's watching this like film. And he's just never seen a movie before and he's just watching it. And you could just see like the, you know, the beauty in his eye where he's just like looking at this thing and just like, you know, this is beautiful. All the ugliness I've, I've, you know, seen in the world like this right here is, is beautiful. And I think he compares the actors to angels or something like that. And just like throughout the whole movie, just his sadness at the ugliness in the world and just how he performs. And it's, He's very limited because his, you know, dialogue is so little because he's an uneducated character. But you could see, even though he's uneducated um, in a formal sense, he's kind of the smartest character in the whole movie. Um, and Michael Clark D Duncan, gone too soon, rest in peace, um, crushed that freaking performance and really made that movie. So I love him so much in that. Yeah, I'm, I'm honestly surprised because I thought you you said there was a clear number one. I, I think there's a lot of great performances, but um, no, it's a fair one. I, I I think there's a clear number one for me. Well, that that's a clear one for me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but but it was interesting because I thought you were going to go a different actor, so I was ready with. And I know Carrie's not going to pick either of them, but I was ready with Pacino and Russell Crowe. Like, which one do I like more? Because I wanted to give the insider some rep, and I love their performances. But now that you let him come to me, I'm going to pick Haley Joel Osment for the Sixth Sense Ooh. because I think he's absolutely terrific i think yes that was what i thought you were going with when you were like oh there's a clear number one um but michael clark duncan's amazing obviously but i i just think Haley jawsman i think also given his age the amount of just professionalism yeah. and and maturity he's able to bring to that role you sometimes forget he's a kid you know he, he's just going toe-to-toe -to -toe with bruce willis and i think he's out acting bruce willis like i think he's amazing in it and I yeah. think he's just truly the best part of that movie next to tony collette but like I think he has also has a lot more to do than Tony Collette to where like there are just a little uh, a few more moments to me that stick out with him to where he's the highlight for me. But the two of them together really is so amazing. And I, I'm so yeah. glad you picked Michael Clark Duncan too, though, because he was like, if for some reason, well, I, I wouldn't have had third pick, but like it was the insider, insider guys, Haley Joel Osment and Michael Clark Duncan were all like competing there for me because um, they're all amazing. Haley like, Joel was in my head. I was like, yeah, yeah. That, was I, that the one you were originally talking about? No. Oh, okay. And um, well, actually, I'll I well I'll let Carrie pick. Yeah, let Carrie because because he might come up later. I don't think she's but, gonna pick this person, but yeah, we'll see. Billy Joel Osment is my, my pick. Though. So, uh, Carrie, go ahead. Okay. Um. And yeah, interestingly, I had three in mind, right? Because I'm going third. I knew I was going third, and those were two of my three that I had in mind. Um. So my other one, uh, which I'm happy to say, is Tom Hanks in The Green Mile. Nice. Um, cool. I think he just gives such a such a subtle performance in this movie, but um, it's, it's still so fantastic. He's, he's really still at his, I mean, when is he not at his prime, but um, I, I think, I think he just, I don't know. I guess I'm having trouble putting it into words, but I think he gives Tom just Hanks, a man. I mean, um, I'll say right now, Tom Hanks has now, Tied Diane Keaton for the most picture this awards with Captain four. Phillips, Horace Gump, and this. And Saving Private Ryan. So he's at four. Oh, right. um, tied with Diane Keaton, who oh. has four. So, and it's funny because if I had, if he had picked Haley Jalosman, I would have gone Pacino. Pacino would have gotten to four. So 
one of them was getting four either way. Uh, There's so still really chances cool. for Pacino, I'm sure, right? Oh, there, yeah, there, yeah. There are at least two <laughs> two notable ones still, and and maybe even some underlier ones that might come. But uh, yeah, that's great. And, any last comments, uh, Chad? Uh, what was yeah. the other one you were thinking? It was a Tom Hanks. It, no, it was Chris Cooper. I yeah. love I love Chris Cooper. I love him, American Beauty. I love him, in October Sky adaptation. Yeah, he's great. Now. He's so good, man. I, I, I uh, oh man, I don't the know. The Muppet movie. The, the Muppet, Muppet movie. He's so <laughs> he's so, when he raps in the Muppet movie. Oh my God, he's amazing. Yeah, he's great in Little Women too. He has some beautiful moments with Beth and Little Women. Oh yeah. Women. Um, wait, right. hold on. I I'm gonna. Uh, I just need to find this picture. Yep. So. <laughs> Picture this. <laughs> on the streets of New York one day. Nice. <laughs> I think I, I remember you telling me that you met him once. Yeah, so I, cool. I went to see um, a show on Broadway called A Doll's House Part 2, which is a sequel to uh, Doll's House. But uh, yeah, it was him and Lori Metcalf. She didn't come out to meet anyone. Um, mm. She went out. Uh, she might have left the stage door later, but it was raining. So Chris Cooper ran right out. Not ran, but like he was he was quick to go home because he was he, he wanted to go home. You know, he's an old man. Yeah. He just wants to go home. Didn't want to hang around too long. But we, he did stop for a picture, which was very nice. Even though he's not smiling in that picture, he was very nice. I promise. <laughs> he's got a I'm resting, sure, angry I'm face. Sure he's amazing. Yeah. Um, I, I do want to say a bit of a foreshadowing. It's very possible that Lori Metcalf could end up with an award from our show at some point. I, I can almost guarantee you she will. Um, <laughs> I'm not I'm gonna tip my hand there. Also, I did find the CD of Larry Bagby, the essentials. Nice. So, shout out, Larry, oh, yeah. if you're listening. Uh, I hope you are. Uh, and say hi to Thora and uh ooh, what's her name from uh, the insider? uh buffy say hi to uh, uh um, lindsey krauss for us lindsey too krauss. lindsey krauss and thor birch um but there you go let me recap uh really quick uh because now we're hitting the 220 mark uh which is great still not as long as the insider of the green mile guys we're doing well um so our <laughs> our best actors uh carries is tom hanks for the green mile uh chad's is michael clark duncan for the green mile mine is Haley joel osmond for the sixth sense best actress carrie picked tony colette for the sixth sense uh chad has mina suveri for uh, american beauty and i have olivia williams for the sixth sense and our best film uh is the green mile our best picture um for this month and tom hanks hitting number four uh there for uh picture this wins congratulations sir the other ones having their first win here uh which is very exciting um so there you have it so next month next month uh another we like to pair new releases that are coming with maybe their remakes. We watched All Quiet on the Western Front because of the other one that came out. We watched West Side Story because of that one coming out. We have a movie coming out in December that had a another version of it. Uh, the new movie coming out is not a uh, direct adaptation of the movie, but more so the musical that was also based on the book. It's a convoluted like thing. Hairspray. Um, yes, but uh, it is uh, The Color Purple is coming out in December. So we're going to talk about the original year, 1985, when The Color Purple was nominated for a record uh, amount of nominations that it lost. It, it is tied with The Turning Point, uh, and I think that's it. The, that and The Turning Point for the most most nominated movie to not win a single Oscar with 11. Wow. Um, so oh that God. is a historical thing. Uh, but we're talking about four other movies in addition to Color Purple. The slate is, oddly enough, starting with the Color Purple. We're also talking about Kiss of the Spider Woman, Out of Africa, Pritzi's Honor, and a movie that I criminally didn't see on draft day, Witness. We are finally watching yeah, those five right. films um, for 1985. I have seen none of them. And out of uh, Africa so was the winner. Out of Africa was the really? winner, um, so we'll talk about that one. Even though Color Purple uh, has that uh, <laughs> that honor and Prizzy's honor, I know nothing about Kiss of the Spider Woman and Witness. I've heard great things about it too, so I'm I'm very excited for the slate, uh, mm. mid '80s slate. We've only done two other '80s movies, and it's been the tail beginning and end '80 80 and '89. So it'll be nice to kind of be in the middle there with '85. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, Carrie, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, it was such a thank pleasure, you. and I'm so glad we got to talk about spooky movies and and that a Stephen <laughs> King movie won on. October. Yeah. That's really awesome. Um, but uh, thanks. Any any final words? And uh, where can they find you? Um, thanks for having me. This is awesome. It's it's so interesting because I, you know, I watch a lot of the movies with Chad, and then you know, I always you know hear um hear you guys you know downstairs when Chad's recording, like doing picture lists and watch you guys. Um, it's cool to actually be on. And I appreciate you having me. Yeah. And you'll be back. I, I'm going to start yeah. borrowing the Griffey Nooms blank check uh, title of past and future guest. Um, <laughs> because I, I love that. Um, so our past, our, our present and future guest, Carrie Webb here. Uh, she will be back uh, whenever she wants. But uh, where can they find you, Carrie? 
Um, Chad and I do a show with Hunter Chambliss on the Nerd Entertainment Network called Welcome to Primetime, where we talk all things horror. And then on Chad's channel, where he ranks different things, um, I'm usually on a lot of those videos. We, I think we've actually only completed and put out one, maybe two. We are, we're, we were trying to do 61 Days of Horror and then kind of like, okay. And then uh, kind of discuss and rank 10 movies at a time. Um, so that's there. Nice, nice. Um, yeah. Chad, where can they find you? And any last comments on 99 as we head into 85? Well, Kara was a beautiful guest. She she crushed it. I can't wait to have her back, actually, because um, there's a lot of really great. Like, the conversation flowed with her really well. Yeah. Um, but I will say, uh, looking at the next slate, um, I'm, I'm excited. I've seen the color purple once, but a long oh, time ago, I barely remember it. And I also have seen witness that mm -hmm. those are the two that I've seen of that slate. Uh, but yeah, we could be talking about this color purple now and then it's successor or it's later, uh, edition mm -hmm. come March or April or whatever, if that yeah. gets nominated, cause it's yeah. people are expecting maybe, yeah, or if um, they remake out of Africa someday. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, you could check me out the the um, the normal places. Um, yeah, Carrie already plugged uh, the Chadwick Webb uh, YouTube channel where we rank stuff. We're doing 61 days of uh, Halloween. Um, I'm trying to like you know do some reactions and reviews and stuff on there, but you know the, mostly the 61 days is what I've been working the hardest with um, recently. Um, check out yeah the Nerd Entertainment Network. Welcome to Prime Time. We do uh, horror stuff. We rank Buffy episodes, and we do a lot of brackets trying to figure out what's the best horror film of all time. So if you're curious, check that out. Um, yep, uh, uh, Larry. I uh, hope to meet him one day. Um, and then uh, check out. Well, you're watching picture of this. Can't plug that. But, <laughs> you can still um, plug it. Check out our yeah, past episodes. Yeah, They're great. Past episodes, especially. The, the first one, 1994, where I first wore this shirt and why I bought this shirt. Which Chad and I have talked about when we finish this thing, our final episode before we go on to our next endeavor will be uh, Redux of 94. Just now that we've found our groove, like we'll do 94 again with the modern, like, oh, we figured out our, our banter. Because back then it was very guinea pig of like, how are we going to do this thing? And yeah. now that we know, we'll go back. And because oh. now having been employed... Um, buy one of those five films and having to watch it every day about three times a day. Uh, maybe it'll change my opinion on one of them. So uh, we'll talk about it. <laughs> not not in my opinion on the movie at whole, but just my, you know, my personal attachment to it. Yeah. Um, oh, um, yeah, that's it for plugging. Uh, this was a great episode and um, can't wait for the next one. Yeah. And you can find me at Dylan Nerdscreen on Twitter and or Letterboxd. Everyone, the big news of the week, Martin Scorsese is now on Letterboxd, so go follow him as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks thanks to his daughter. Uh, I think, her, is her name Francesca? I don't remember. I'm forgetting him one. Uh, and you can find me here at the Dill Pickle Movie Network if you're listening on podcast. Check us out on YouTube. If you're on YouTube, check us uh, check us out on the Dill Pickle Podcast and check out the Dill Pickle Movie Network TikTok, where I have been counting down my 31 days of Halloween. And uh, this is part of our Hollow weekend. So uh, you're going to get a different video Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Um, um, this is the Sunday video, uh, so check out on Monday, which is tomorrow. We already saw a picture, a frame wreck yesterday, where we talked, Chad and I are talking to Matt Chapman about uh, the Halloween 456. Uh, today's picture this. Tomorrow, my long anticipated, uh, I, I recorded it, it's in the back burner, but I need to edit it still. Um, I saw a patrol review, I, I did the double feature, I did it. Um, and then, uh, <laughs> uh, and also check out a saw ranking on Chad's channel eventually, because uh, it, it was really fun. And then, um, on Monday, or sorry, that's Tuesday, you'll be getting a double of a draft day and a Halloween performances draft day and a Kelsey and I's wrap-up of our 31 days of Halloween. Um, and that is, I think, it for now. So we'll see you all in 85. We're going to go back in time a little bit more. Uh, and this was 99. Thanks so much for watching, y'all. Uh, you got a friend in me. I don't know, Toy Story 2. I just saw it. I glanced down at my paper. It said Toy Story 2. Um, all right. Bye, guys. Bye.